Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest who's achieved a level of mastery as the drummer for the three-time Juno-nominated band Colorado. So welcome to the podcast, Jake Boyd. Jake, how are you? And how were your cottage adventures over the weekend? I saw a few updates on Instagram and it looked like yeah, you had a blasty blast. It looked like a good time. Yeah, it was really nice. It is always funny to get up there and completely disconnect from real life and then connect back with real life and be like, oh, yeah, real life. I had done some some meditation uh, courses and the the challenge is. It's, it's easy enough to do when you're there, but it's how do you take that meditation, that stillness and bring it back into the chaotic real world? And that's kind of what you have when you go away to the cottage, you you're in the moment, you're enjoying, enjoying it, the peace. And then you come back with technology and, and life is a little harder. Yeah. Do you, do you practice meditation on a regular basis, Joel? I try to. Yeah. So I, I had done a uh, 48 hour a silent meditation retreat, which was like absolutely life-changing. And for a while I was doing an hour meditation every morning. And wow. now I, I try to do at least 10 minutes every morning. And on a good day, I'll do a half hour or an hour, but it's definitely not every day. It's not as consistent as it should be, but man, it'll, it'll change your life. And the last yeah. thing I'll say about meditation is um, for, for about a decade now, I've been studying like millionaires and billionaires and personal growth and mm-hmm. almost every single successful person, there's about three things that they all do in common. And one of them is, is meditation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other two are probably maybe exercise, maybe something having to do with their sleep schedule or habits, maybe dietary things. Yeah. You, you need you need the, uh, the health side. So, yeah. I mean, you, you can't have longevity if, if you're not healthy. So that's one of them, but, um, all of them have some form of gratitude, like a gratitude journal. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, it's the, the thought is the universe will not give you more of what you want if you're not already grateful for what you have. So basically right. it's like, if the, the universe gives you all this great stuff happening and it doesn't seem like you're appreciative it'll just take it away that i guess that's the thought behind it right and then the the second thing is that if you're not grateful for what you already have if you get all the things that you think you want then you won't actually be happy because you're already not happy with the things that you have at this point right right And, and they all they all have a clear vision of a future that is worth sacrificing for so they can picture where they're going which allows them to set clearly defined goals and, and reverse engineer from where they want to be to where they are now and, and know that there are steps in between and then break it down. Like they just have this clarity. And, uh, you know, it's said that if, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to fall into someone else's plan of where you should go. So, you know, if you're just kind of drifting, it's like someone that does have a clear vision, you're going to get sucked into their vortex and, and follow their plan and not your own. So you need your own that, that is your, your GPS guiding you in the right direction. Yeah. I I think I fundamentally agree with literally everything you've just said. So right on, we're off to a good start. Yeah. That doesn't (laughs) happen often. So I'm glad you agree. (laughs) You agree right off the bat. Uh, So I like to always start the, the interviews by sharing how we know each other uh, so that our, our listeners uh, realize the importance of, of networking, of, of building community and connection. So our story goes back to uh, back to Ottawa. So both our bands we're in the same music scene starting, say, around 2007. So 
we we were always playing and I, I remember my drummer was was a, a fan of you guys and he would always report back to us with the success that you're having and they're they're out they made a music video and they're out touring here and you know you guys always inspired us to to kind of work to the next level and at some point I moved to Toronto you guys moved to Montreal um a bunch of years went by then in Toronto, a few things started to happen where Colorado was back, you know, in my orbit. So I was a part of a music video shoot for you guys. I'll talk about that later. Um, you guys were headlining a festival out in the Toronto area uh, that was put on by someone that I know. So I went out and I supported you guys and supported that friend. Uh, suddenly we're back in the same bubble for a little bit. Then in the last 13 months during the pandemic, I moved back to my hometown of Ottawa. I believe you might have moved back to your hometown of Ottawa. And, Correct, yeah. and I, I started going out to this open mic and suddenly you were the special guest performing at this open mic. So we reconnected. I asked if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast. And alas, here we are today. So that's, that's the history of, of how we got to where we are. Nice. I feel... Like that's really organized. I feel like you organize your thoughts really well. And I appreciate that because I think that that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. Well, for this podcast, for the sake of like a two hour interview that makes sense, I <laughs> yeah, have to get have organized, to. <laughs> but I, I can't say that the rest of my life is, is that organized. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to kick off this, this podcast episode in style. So I reached out to somebody to help me kick this off. Uh, so here are a few words from your brother, Nick oh. Boyd. So guitarist from Colorado, he says, I love Jake for his honesty and dedication to everything he does. His drumming is amazing and it's always getting better. So that's your brother, Nick Boyd, Colorado band member. That's really nice. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Isn't it nice to, to hear some kind words from, from a family member? We don't always yeah. get that, you know? It's really nice. He is a really busy guy and... So as you mentioned, I've moved back to the sort of greater Ottawa area. I don't live downtown by any means. I live out in the country, but, you know, I, I live in Ottawa in some senses of the word, in the in senses of the words. And there was a period of time for probably about a decade that I would see and if not see, then speak over the phone. And if not speak over the phone, then at least text back and forth with Nick every single, every single day. So days and, you know, a lot of days where we would do all three of those things, text, talk on the phone and actually see each other in real life. Some of that was social. Some of that was work. Some of that was that sort of music work where you're like, wait, are we just hanging out or, or are we working on it? Even really? No. You know, other than Colorado, we had another just for fun band called Stella Ella Ola. He was a part of uh, an artist named Bossy with another member of Stella and his wife, like all of all of the Colorado sort of greater family was incredibly incestuous. And it was like, you know, a small ish group of people doing a pretty radical number of things. And almost everything that I did had Nick involved and to some degree and sort of vice versa. So getting back to where I'm living now, it's really weird. And it has been weird since the pandemic started to not see him nearly as much. It's sad. It's not, it's not a super awesome thing. I really love Nick as well. And one of the, I don't, I don't carry a lot of regret in my life and I don't really dwell on the past very much at all. I, I tend to either think about the future or try and live you know, in the present, as we were talking about earlier, but really one of the only things that bums me out is the wrong word because it's too intense, but really one of the only things that I would change about my life if I could would be seeing him more often and a number of other people as well, which obviously we've had two plus years of nobody seeing anyone. So whatever it is, what it is, but one of the greatest joys of my life in that period of 10 or so years was just us hanging all the time because yeah, he's a good guy. So is, is he in the Toronto area? He lives in Aurelia, Ontario, but is still running a studio in 
sort of West End Toronto, and then is also this summer, right now, in the process of starting a new studio in the Aurelia area. The studio in Toronto is called Banquet Sound. The studio in Aurelia, I need to check my phone because he just told me the name and I, I should have it here. We're going to uh, give a powerful shout out. Yeah, okay. The new studio is going to be called Simcoe Mechanical and it's going to be in Aurelia. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, musician Taylor Knox and also maybe Anne Duris, they're all involved in some way. And it's this is the thing that's being created right now. Maybe I might get in trouble for talking about this. I don't know. This might be. This is breaking secret. news. We like oh to break gosh. news on the podcast. If, Nick, if if I'm spilling the beans, uh, then I'm doing the same thing that I've been doing our entire lives and just talking too much. So I'm sorry. You're giving him some free promotion. I, I, think, <laughs> he should, I think he should be happy. Yeah. Either way, uh, I feel like throughout my life, uh, talking too much has been a theme, which when you asked me to do this, it comes naturally to me. You thought I have, I could speak for two hours and I'm allowed <laughs> to, and it's supported. This is amazing. Uh, you mentioned Which also, te- go ahead. Well, well the, the silent meditation, that's sort of the antithesis of this, right? So th- those two things are probably a nice yin and yang for you, right? Yeah. Well, also during the pandemic, I'm, I'm a social guy. Before the pandemic, I was running lots of big events in Toronto, probably three, three days a week. I'd have like 20 to 30 people in my house doing different business ventures and networking. And, uh, you know, it's been tough during the pandemic the last two years where the world is like, actually, you're just going to sit alone in your house for two years and not have any friends and not be social, you know, it's tough on the mental health. So this, this, I've been doing this for about the length of the the pandemic and it's actually been really helpful for me to still feel connected to other people and still have good conversations. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And that this is just a natural extension of energy that you already kind of had pent up anyways. Right. Yeah, you got to get out that pent up aggression somewhere. And if you can do it in a in a positive manner, that's that's good. Uh, you, you mentioned with Aurelia, with your brother, Taylor Knox, is is he in a band? I recognize the name. I think I don't know whether he does anymore. I'm fairly sure he was playing drums for Hayden. OK, but I think his primary musical thing is his own project, Taylor Knox. It's under that moniker. And there's a bunch of. I mean, fantastic. It's sort of like kind of mellow indie rock, I guess. I never know how to describe anything. That's the toughest thing, right? It's that's difficult enough with music that you're involved with. But yeah, I think like kind of cool, chill, mellow indie rock would be, I don't think anybody would be offended for me to describe it that way. Yeah, I, I when I think of Aurelia, I could have this wrong, but there's, I think there's a band called Bleaker. They used to be Bleaker Ridge, and I think they just go by Bleaker. And okay. there's, a, there's a backstory. Um, way back in the day, uh, my band opened up for the Mud Men, who have been a guest on the podcast. So we were, were opening, I think it was at Mavericks in Ottawa. Okay. And they they were touring. So there was us in the middle. Mud Men were headlining. And Mud Men had this young band on the road with them called Bleaker Ridge. And these guys get on stage and they were literally like 12, 13, maybe 14. Like they were kids and they get on and it was like Led Zeppelin. Like the singer (laughs) could could sing. The guitarist was shredding. Like it was literally like a young Led Zeppelin. And we're like, who the hell is this band? And they went on to, um, I was at Warner Music and Publishing for a bit. And within Warner was uh, the office for Roadrunner Records that had all these huge metal bands. And, and, At that time, Roadrunner had just signed Bleaker Ridge and they had some success with albums. And I believe they're from Aurelia. And I always associate that's like all I know from Aurelia is this crazy young band uh, that were amazing called Bleaker Ridge. I think they changed their name to Bleaker. Uh, They were from Aurelia. So I have to fact check, but that's what's associated with Aurelia for me. Gordon Lightfoot 2. Again, I'm 99.999% sure Gordon Lightfoot is from there. Don't we need a lot or... of fact checking. On yeah, this. yeah. We don't want Man. any fake news, right? We don't want to get Just... flagged here for fake news. So, Well, okay. So before we started, you said, put your phone in airplane mode. It can affect the audio. Great idea. I did it. Perfect. But it's funny how much we rely on that, eh? Yeah. I, it, there's so few things that I'm objectively sure of. Yeah. Without... Yeah. There's, you know, it's, it's, 
life is tough now for the con artists and, and pe <laughs> people that just bullshit all the time. It's like, yeah. you can just fact check on them. So you uh, gotta be a little more truthful now. Wait a second. Yeah. Uh, no, google.com says you're full of shit actually. So no. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can, you don't even have to type. You can just ask Siri or ask yeah. whatever Alexa, if someone's, <laughs> you know, if someone's Tell lying. Yeah, yeah. So man, we have so much to dive into. Uh, Colorado yeah. has an amazing discography. You guys have a huge history that runs, you know, well over a decade. Um, people look at you today and they, they see this guy that was in all these music videos and touring and Juno nominations and a successful band, but, uh, you didn't start, you weren't in diapers playing drums in a, in a rock band. So there's a history there. So I like to go back to the beginning. Can, can you remember an earliest musical memory, maybe a time where music jumped out and, and was important uh, for you for the first time? Yeah. I mean, I remember being four or five, six years old and starting to understand that musical instruments are things that people play sometimes not understanding that that is a job or that's something that you have to work at just that, Oh, that funny noise that's coming out of the stereo in my grandma and grandpa's house. That's people making that noise. And that's because they're playing these things called musical instruments and the really, really cool noisy noise kind of in the background is the drums. And it was, okay, so our, our grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather, grandfather on my mother's side, his name is Nick. So, good name, good name. Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure if my brother is directly named after him or not, but it's sort of just a name that's in our family, right? So Grandpa Nick would play us all these jazz records. And I remember listening to stuff that I then... Later on, found out, oh, Louis Belson, Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa. You know, I'm four, five, six years old. I'm just thinking, well, you just think, oh, that noise sounds really cool. And years later, when I was a teenager, I was heavily into all that big band music and researching, oh, this drummer was named this. This person played with that person. That person was then Louis Armstrong's drummer. And then, you know, whatever. You sort of connecting all the pieces, right? But really, the first... My first musical memory is that hangout at my grandma and grandpa's house in Alta Vista, neighborhood of Ottawa, and Grandpa Nick showing us this music. It's, it's kind of funny, but he also would make radio shows. So Grandpa Nick would make these radio shows where he'd play Glenn Miller. And then afterwards, he'd say, that was Glenn Miller with In the Mood or, or whatever, right? And I still have in my house here in this house, I have a stack of tapes that I, every now and then I throw on grandpa Nick is still alive. He's in his mid nineties, but I have these tapes and they're his radio shows. And some of them he would record and me and Nick would try and be the sort of radio DJs as well. And I think I was probably too young. Mine are a little bit unintelligible, even more so than now at that point in time, I had a tendency to ramble. And so we were connecting with all this music at such a young age. And at some point in time, I remember just saying to people, yeah, I want to play drums. I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't really know what the work involved was. I didn't really know what equipment you needed to do that. I just knew I wanted to be kind of in the background going, ba -ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da, or, you know, in, in the case of do got to get into the case of more rock and roll type music. And then when I was nine years old, I started taking drum lessons at the Manatic School of Music, Manatic, Ontario, just south of Ottawa. That's where we were living at the time. And at some point, I just sort of decided, okay, this is something that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Not that I was going to be a professional drummer and really other than teaching drums, I'm not really a professional drummer now. And I've never really considered myself a professional drummer. It, it's sort of beside the point. It's just something that I want to do. Any day that I can play drums for 5, 10, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, it's almost like whatever else happens that day is completely besides the point. Grandpa Nick sounds pretty awesome. He's uh, a, a cool dude, yeah. 
Yeah. How, how much did growing up in Manatech influence you as a musician and as a person? Well, it's where we started the band, really, ultimately. And I think it's weird because it was growing up in a small town, but it also was not having a lot of modern distractions. I don't know. It's really hard to say because there's two schools of thought here. On the one hand, when I was 13 years old, we might have had a Nintendo 64 or something, and we probably had like a dial-up internet connection or something. We might have even had high speed, which now would be considered completely slow speed, right? I, I can't really remember, but not having a phone and not just being glued to the internet all day long, like so much of us are want to do nowadays, we would just either practice, you know, guitar, bass, drums, whatever you're doing in the basement or have friends over. Oh, okay. You've got a friend that you're going to middle school with. Oh, I know that that person plays guitar, plays bass, plays piano, plays saxophone, whatever. We should just have all these jam sessions, right? And and on the one hand, okay, without the distraction of technology, you have time, energy, and the sort of mental space to do all those things. Yet at the same time, I find myself being massively jealous of kids now that can tap into resources like YouTube, or if they want to buy a drum book, or if they want to take a music lesson, you can take, you can find the best drummer in the world and take a Skype drum lesson with them. It's, for the best drummer in the world, it's going to cost a lot of money, but you but can it's do possible. That. It's possible, right? And it's really interesting that sort of access, you know, versus necessity. And it's like, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's so hard to say how your surroundings actually affected what you ended up doing. But I guess, I mean, Menno, the singer in Colorado, his parents still live four doors down from the house that Nick and I lived at when we were kids. Right. And I, I don't know how all those things shaped what ended up happening, but I know that, okay, the guitar player in the band was my brother. So we lived together. So that's bloody convenient. Dean, the bass player and I have been best friends since we were whatever, 12 years old. He lived in Briar Green, just down the road, you know, maybe a 15 minute drive and Menno lived on the same street as Nick and I. So the specifics of what happened would not, could not have happened without that sort of proximity, right? Isn't it funny how back when we were growing up, it's like times are so different. You'd get home from school and you would just play outside from like four o'clock until it got dark and then you'd come yeah. in for food, you know? And it's like, yeah. I just saw a comedian that said, you know, how different parenting was back then. Like parents could you know, would, could just like leave and their kids would just be alone and it was normal or their kids, they yeah. let their kids go out until it was dark. And they said, the joke was that parents actually, they, people actually on the radio would put out ads basically to remind parents that they had kids. So an ad would come <laughs> on the radio, like to remind you that, you know, uh, you know, as it gets it's started, seven you know, o'clock, yeah, it's seven, seven o'clock. Do you, you know, know where your, your children are? Yeah, 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 exactly. So that was Whereas, the joke. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's the opposite, right? I mean, I don't have children. I, I hope to, and I think I will at some point someday, but it's the opposite. And anytime anything is the opposite, it probably does go too far the other way. And that, that was so cool. There was a little park behind our house in Manitou called McLean Park. And I remember just hanging out with friends and we would just meet up there. There was no, there wasn't even like an MSN messenger, like, yo dog let's meet at the park it was just I, like i see you just, and yeah like but not even that it was just it was a given that you know five or six of us would just meet at this park at whatever time school was was done right yeah and you know later on into your teen years that's when you're like it's legal now experimenting with cannabis perhaps you know that's when you're you're like getting into trouble a little bit but also your house is right there you know um that's where people are, you know, meeting and breaking up with their high school relationships. That's where life actually happened was this little park or the skateboard park in Manatee, right? That's where 
you know, two people would get in a fight or two people would have their first kiss or somebody would smoke a cigarette for the first time. And now they're 35 and trying to quit, you know, like, um, but that for all the potential danger is the wrong word, but for all the potential just messiness that that real life could cause or would cause or did cause it was real life. And certainly during the pandemic, I feel for everyone, but I definitely feel for kids that have been, let's say 14 to 16, and they haven't had for long periods of time, they haven't had any of those real life experiences, which quite frankly, kick the shit out of you, right? Um, even if it's something as simple as, oh, you were good friends with this person and now, now you're not friends with them anymore. Or, you know, you're starting that first band and somebody gets kicked out of the band or somebody doesn't want to be in the band anymore. Or you kind of realize that you're trying to play with somebody and you're, you're just, it's just not working. Maybe they're a good musician, maybe they're not, but it's just not working. Right. And all these, again, the, the starting to explore your sexuality and romance and, and just all these things, right. Experimenting with drugs, all these things that, okay, they can be scary. They're messy, but they are real life. Um, and like, I love technology. You know, I love Twitter so much that I had to quit it, you know, of all the things that I've done too much and then quit Twitter is the most recent one. And it's been like over a month and I feel really good about that. But um, but as much as you might love technology, there's something about, you know, jumping in a van with your three best friends and like the first Colorado tours. And this is the kind of thing that I should be texting the guys to ask, am I misremembering this? But the first tours, the very first tours, we were using maps and I, okay, there definitely were you know, 2007 or eight or nine, there definitely were tours where we're really far away from home. You're maybe in the Southern States or you're in the Western Canadian provinces and you're going, okay, so it looks like this highway connects with that highway. And then that connects with this little arterial road. And I think the venue is kind of in this little pocket. And then you get to the town and you ask, five or six people, you ask somebody at a gas station, Hey, do you know where Jojo's bar is or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever the little dive bar that we're playing at the time that four people are going to show up to and you're all stressed out. You're all stressed out because if we don't make it, then we're not going to make the show and the show won't happen. And you don't want to let those four people down. But I don't, I don't know why anyone could or would do that now right? Who, nobody would go on tour without at least data on their phone or, or a GPS on the dashboard of their vehicle. And I remember printing map quests. Yeah. Map quest. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but then if you miss like, because map quest isn't adjusting to, you to know, real doing. time, it's like, if yeah, you yeah. ever miss that one exit, it's like the, the next two hours worth of map quest is no good for your directions. Okay. Really embarrassing story. And I only bring this up because Dean and I were just chatting about this the other day. So I texted him because I had one of these memories and I was thinking, surely, surely I'm misremembering. So it's 2000, I want to say 10 or 11. So this is like the modern era we're talking about. And there's a venue in Brooklyn at that point in time. I'm not sure whether it still exists anymore, but there's a venue in Brooklyn called Shea Stadium. So not the Shea Stadium that the Beatles played at, not the Shea Stadium where the Mets, I think it's the Mets, right? Play baseball, not the arena, but a little tiny, cool DIY punk rock dive bar called Shea Stadium. So for whatever reason, Nick and Menno said, oh, we're just going to meet you guys at the venue. They wanted to hang out in Brooklyn, do some sightseeing, shopping, whatever. They're, they're going to meet us at the venue. And we decided to stay at the hotel. We were probably hungover. Uh, and we said, okay, perfect. You know, we'll see you guys there. Neither of us, I think we both had smartphones, but neither of us had data on our phones in the US at that point in time. Because at that point it was prohibitively expensive and we had no money, frankly. So 
we printed out MapQuest directions to Shea Stadium from our hotel in Manhattan. Now, again, we were playing at a dive bar in Brooklyn named Shea Stadium, and we printed out, unbeknownst to us, directions to Shea Stadium, the arena where the Beatles played, where the Mets play baseball. Completely not in the same direction, completely not in the same vicinity. And we literally were rolling up with, you know, Mets flags and a massive arena in front of us where we sort of turned to each other and said, oh, yeah, I think we fucked up. I feel like there's a valid lawsuit there that you could <laughs> you could get wealthy from if it still exists. But. Well, but I well, I mean, maybe, but all that we lost was our time. And at that point in, in our lives, our time was not worth a whole lot. So I don't know. And also, you know, by the time we got to the venue, at least this is how I'm remembering it. Everyone else involved thought it was hilarious because we had made such a dumb mistake. You know, so yeah, maybe we didn't sound check. And it was, it was again a DIY punk rock space. So it didn't really matter. Sound checking, if anything, would maybe make you sound worse, right? Because you're worried about it. But it's like, okay, whatever, plug in the guitars, adjust the cymbal height and just let's go, right? It'd be funny if you guys showed up to the arena or the stadium and you actually thought like, holy shit, like this, this they one. really, this is a great <laughs> gig, whoever booked this. And like, you know, you're walking through the arena, like you own it and like, you know, yeah, no, we're playing here tonight and security's like, oh, they, they seem confident. Okay, go, go ahead. Like you end up somehow actually, you know, opening for the, you know, whoever the that baseball night. game. Yeah. yeah. Opening for the Mets. Game, you end up doing, pitch. you end up, yeah, you do end up doing the anthem or something. <laughs> and we sing O Canada because we don't know what's going on. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think at that point in time, and I think honestly, I think throughout our entire career as a band, we were pretty aware of our place. Um, maybe almost to a fault, maybe almost to up the point of being self-effacing a little bit. I think we were, we were pretty aware of, okay, you know, we've achieved some things, but really, you know, we're just, we, we, I think we mostly felt happy to be happy to be here. was kind of the, the vibe. As, as a kid, was there anything you wanted to be before deciding that you wanted to be a, a drummer and have a career in the music industry? I mean, I, Hmm, that's a good question. I just wanted to hang out with my friends and play drums. You know, even, even now, I mean, I play pretty often. I definitely miss playing drums with other people, but I don't think especially because, okay, I was 18 when we started the band and I don't think the idea of what you're going to be when you grow up really registered with me. Uh, so I guess short answer, no. I had a lot of ideas of, oh, I might go to university for this. I might try and study that. But then I ended up dropping out after six months of not studying and not really going to class. So there was never really anything actionable in terms of, oh, I want to do this in, instead. It was sort of just, this is what I want to do right now. And I'll worry about later on, later on. And it worked out to, to the degree that it worked out. You know, so if we were friends at 16 and I was in Manatech and you invited me over to your place to listen to some music, what what albums would be in rotation there? Oh, my gosh. OK, so it depends on the month of that year, because. And a lot of this stuff. Would be stuff that I still listen to now. So do you know the punk band Propagandi? So the album, the two albums, Less Talk, More Rock and today's empires tomorrow's ashes i think it's called those two are albums that i listened to a ton at that age and i still listen to now there are some miles davis records that i still listen to now that i listen to then a ton it's all over the place and it kind of always has been and i feel like that's almost a, it's a tough thing to reconcile because i feel like as a listener my taste is super eclectic but I think that everything that I really like listening to and everything that's really connected to me has some sort of element of really, really true outspoken rebellion, not in a, not necessarily in a rage against the machine sort of way, although I do love them, but just in a sense of you're very aware of what the rules are and you're not doing that. 
So like you know, the clash or someone like that, that's yeah. clearly anti, anti-establishment or um, yeah. Iggy pop or, you know, whoever. Yeah. And yeah. And not even, not even strictly anti-establishment, but just sort of, okay. That's what you all are doing. And I'm going to point out maybe a bit of the hypocrisy in that, you know, the sort of, that's why a lot of the jazz drummers and a lot of the jazz musicians are so cool. And I think that's why a lot of their art endures. And I think a lot of art that endures is art that is saying not necessarily, uh, fuck you, but rather, okay, there's a system and I'm going to both work within it and kind of around it at the same time and point out the sort of deviousness and hypocrisy in said system, whether that's a lot of the jazz musicians, they were pointing out, okay, classical music convention, right? Forget that. Punk rock musicians were sort of saying, okay, we're going to play the same music, but the idea of it sounding really clean and crisp, forget that hip hop artists a lot of them said okay the idea that lyrics are going to be a certain way forget that right like every one of these big jumps in music history has really been led by somebody saying okay i'm going to take the thing the convention and flip it on its head and i think whatever i was listening to when i was 16 and when I go through records and CDs that I've had for how fucking old am I? Uh, 15, 20 years. A lot of them that I still really love now that I love then, that's that's the common thread. It isn't necessarily, oh, the drumming was great or, or it's a certain genre of music. It's more just, it's kind of, angry is the wrong word, but it's the first one that comes to mind. It has a strong identity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more of more than a anti disestablish, you know, more, more, more than just being against the current convention. It's a real hyper awareness. Right. And that's how you kind of play within a system as an artist. I think, I don't know. I mean, it's not really something I think about that often, but when I do look back at the music that I loved, 15, 20 years ago, and that I still love now, that's the common thread that it's, it's, again, angry is the wrong word, but it's the first one that kind of comes to mind. Do you think that that eclectic taste in music has helped you as a drummer to be able to play with, with different acts that don't all sound the same? I mean, I think at any point in time, if any drummer wants to be any level of successful, they have to do that. Unless you're very lucky and you've got a really steady thing. But again, you just had Glenn from Blue Rodeo on the podcast, right? Yeah, that so, episode so, drops uh, today. So, Oh, amazing. Yeah. So he's the perfect example. He's the perfect drummer for Blue Rodeo. He's a fantastic drummer. I'm a really big fan of both him as a person and his work. But there's so many things he can do on a drum kit that he doesn't do with Blue Rodeo necessarily. And I think if you look at anyone who plays drums, if they are any modicum of successful, you'll find that. You'll find that they don't necessarily have jazz chops, but they're kind of aware of that world. They don't necessarily know how to play through orchestral snare pieces, but they're aware of that world. And I mean, again, there are people who their training on the drum set is hyper-specialized and there are people for whom which that's the case that are really successful. And I would say, wow, that's, that's just really lucky. You know, (laughs) the sort of, um, well, I was going to say Charlie Watts, but he, even he was into jazz. He wasn't necessarily a jazz drummer, but he, he kind of dabbled in that world a little bit, but the people who are hyper-specialized in what they do and are really successful i think in any industry are probably few and far between yeah glenn uh glenn mentioned that he he had played in some pretty heavy bands before blue rodeo and there's yeah there's one artist i think it's andrew cash that he played with that's like 
ties everything together. So, you know, heavier bands and then blue rodeo. And then he played with Andrew cash. That was a little bit closer to blue rodeo, which is where they saw that he might be a good fit for them. But he was saying that when he first played for blue rodeo, when he looks back at the early videos of him performing, he sounds like he's drumming for Megadeth. Like he's way (laughs) over the top and he had to adjust and yeah. Yeah. And for him, it drumming was a big part of drumming when you're, that talented is actually um, a lesson in restraint, like not showing all the crazy things you can do, but it's, it's putting the ego aside and what is actually best for the song that I'm playing on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love watching drum solo videos on YouTube. You know, I don't necessarily do that all the time, but every now and then I'll go down a rabbit hole and watch Sheila E and Neil Pert and whatever, all of the Danny Carey from Tool. What, yeah, yeah, you know, and watch these extended drum solos. Cause for me, as a nerd, I find that extremely entertaining. But if I'm waking up in the morning and I want to, you know, go for a run, or I've got errands to do, or if I'm working at a job and I need some sort of comfort food music, it's not going to be drum solos you know, and it's not going to be something with really complex drums in it. And really a lot of my favorite music has little or no drums, or it has completely programmed electronic drums, or it's got a drummer that's going get get for the whole three minutes of the song, you know, and that, I think that that's one of the beautiful things about playing this instrument right here is that it really forces you to go, okay, it's like we were talking about earlier in terms of technology and access, right? Okay, you've got access. I've got this, I've got this Tom here, this Tom here, this Tom here, but really like hats and snare drum is probably what your hands are going to be doing or ride and snare drum is probably what your hands are going to be doing most of the time. Like I always say, I I teach drums, right? And I I always say to students that really the toms are kind of like the flavor drums and okay. Yeah. You could, you could play beats where your right hand is riding on maybe the four tom or something, but really most of the time when you're using the toms and you're playing all around the drum set and you're moving from one drum to the next, that stuff's really fun to work on, right? It tickles your brain in a way that is to my experience, unlike any other drug, that is just so fun. It's such a fun Rubik's cube to play with. I've never been able to do an actual Rubik's cube. So it's a weird metaphor to choose, but really if you're going to be playing with other musicians and if you're playing in a pop rock sort of idiom, you're probably, probably going to be playing some version of eighth notes with your right hand, two and three and four, and your left hand is probably going two, three, four, you know, and And that's sort of, okay, I can do all these things, but I choose not to, or I choose to do them really selectively. I think that that's kind of a good lesson for the modern world in general. I can connect to the world through my phone, through the internet, whatever. And I want to be really selective about how I do that. I can make all this fun noise, but most of the time it's going to be just get get and i i think in you know in our hyper connected world that seems like it's just moving faster and faster all the time and that's part of that's just me getting older and part of that's objective truth i think that that's a really important lesson and and really you know like this stuff is is my therapy 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 is good also uh but having an outlet like whatever it may be for in my case it's it's playing this instrument that's still 20 plus years later confuses the hell out of me i think that that it's just good for you right it's just good for your soul yeah when when i so what was was the question (laughs) uh what was the question (laughs) uh we're obviously we're talking about drums um oh what music would you play oh yeah, uh, yeah would you what what kind of music would you play if i went over to your house so you went through all this different music but then um i asked if that 
variety of listening, the eclectic taste in music, if that helps you as a drummer to be able to play with different styles of, of genres and bands. Um, so I think that was the original question. Uh, just from you hitting those toms, when I promote this episode, I'm going to say there was a live performance from Jake <laughs> right on the drums. Uh, yeah. I might embellish a little bit. Do, but, uh, do. Yeah, 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 people are going to watch the whole two hours, you know, waiting for this drum solo. And, <laughs> but, you know, I, it wouldn't be a lie. You did. It, there was a live drum performance. But uh, anyways, uh, you, you talked about your grandpa uh, playing these jazz greats. Um, who were who your earliest drum heroes? So, you know, besides maybe those jazz guys you mentioned. And then today, is it still the same drum heroes or have new ones come along the way? Interesting. I mean... I was such a big fan of John Bonham and all the obvious classic rock ones. And I was such a big fan of Art Blakey, Buddy Rich, Elvin Jones, all the obvious jazz ones. Nowadays, I mean, somebody who I've got a lot of respect for in the modern sort of music world is Questlove. And from that's- the, From the roots. From and the roots, Jimmy yeah. Fallon. Yeah. And that's got a lot to do with the way that as we were talking about, he, he really does serve the music of whatever project he's playing on, but also it might sound kind of funny, but not strictly a drummer, but Dr. Dre, if you listen to all of the one or two bar loops that are in those Tupac songs, those Dr. Dre songs, those NWA songs and those Eminem songs, that really, to my knowledge, he, you know, composed those beats to use his parlance. Some of those are fantastic drum beats. And that's him, you know, mapping that out. I mean, and again, maybe, maybe that was a studio engineer that did all that. I have no idea. But a lot of, a lot of the coolest drum stuff is, and that's, that's a song that's over 20 years old, right? Uh, what's it called? Still, still DRE. A lot of the coolest drum stuff is not even somebody on a drum kit, but now who, who are the, were you, were you asking who are the drummers I respect the most or biggest influences? What's the, um, you know, we all have as a guitarist, it's like, I had my original guitar heroes, people I looked up to like Mike, the guitarist from stained. And, you know, I'm uh, just wondering if you had certain drummers you just loved as a teenager. And, and if those are the same, you know, if you could, if you could sit down with anyone today for a conversation, would it still be the same kind of drum heroes from, from back then? Yeah, I think. I mean, okay, also when I was 20, all of my heroes were dead by the time they were my age. I'm 34 now. When I was 20, all of my heroes were dead before the 34th birthday. So that's a, a tough qualification to become one of your yeah. heroes. Sorry, yeah. dude, you're still alive, so you don't. <laughs> well, okay. Not but there's something you can do to to join those ranks. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean though? So I really, really loved John Bonham. I really, really loved Keith Moon. And then you grow up a little bit and you sort of realize, oh, these were people who were actually struggling and that's why they died young. It wasn't because when I was 20, I would have thought somewhere along the, line, along the lines of, oh, these were rock stars and they achieved everything that they were put on this earth to achieve. And that's so badass and cool that they died at 32 or 27 or 33 or whatever, right? Whereas now, in many ways, I think you can be in your 30s and feel like your life is just starting. And I think that that's a cool place to be. And a lot of my musical heroes are the ones that just kind of endure, right? The ones that just keep making things or keep playing or what have you. And again, somebody like Questlove really com comes to mind because, you know, I've can't remember the last time I watched a whole episode of the Jimmy Fallon show. I really don't care. But when I have even watched it's on TV or whatever, and you watch a snippet of it, the coolest parts are always when, to, in my mind, when the camera's on Questlove and they're doing some sort of comedic bit and it involves what he's doing on the drums or what have you. Right. And I don't know how old he is now. I'm assuming he's in his forties, whatever the roots, 
I've certainly been a band for two decades, maybe three, 90s, maybe four even, I don't know, whatever. They, they've endured, right? And he's had something cool to say literally the whole time. Also, his book is really, well, he's written multiple books, but his one, I think it's called Creative Quest, is super duper worth checking out because it's, it's not only about working in a creative field, it's about applying creativity to every little thing that you do in your life. You're cooking breakfast in the morning. Okay, what can I do to just kind of make a smiley face with some bacon? Yeah. Whatever, right? Yeah. And it's, a, it's about even in the business relationships in your life, how can I apply creativity to that? Even in dealing with your own health, even in dealing with your own mental health, how can I just use that creative power that we as artistic people can harness? How can we kind of just use that to sort of just like, you're kind of just playing with life, you know, rather than thinking of everything in such a clinical way, how can you kind of, as cheesy as it sounds, be an artist in every little thing you do? And I think that that's his approach on the drums and it seems like it's it's his approach in production and how i got over the roots record is one of my favorite albums i've got it on vinyl somewhere and i think that that you know that record really typifies that his whole just like light but kind of taking it seriously at the same time sort of vibe yeah so i i mean I still also, you know, you're driving and you turn on Shea 106 just to see the, the classic rock radio station in Ottawa where we both live for anyone who, who might be watching or listening to this and doesn't know that radio station. I don't know why I'm giving Shea 106 a plug, but hey, here we are. And uh, Black Dog comes on. And you're like, yeah, that's still is super sick, right? Yeah, I think um, if Led Zeppelin came out today with any of their albums, like as a new band, it would still be unbelievable, you know? Yeah, I think I would probably say out loud, well, those are some pretty cheesy lyrics, but I think it's just so fun, you know? So my girlfriend and I have been watching the Sex Pistols show. It's called Pistol. And it's not necessarily a great show, but I keep thinking about it all the time because it's just so fun. And that's, you know, another example of a total, like, okay, call them punk if you want, but really it's classic rock, right? Um, and all of the, that show features like all this Bowie music and all the, obviously the sex pistol stuff. And I don't think they had a fun time as a band. There was a lot of like drug abuse and, and really like clashing personalities, but the music itself, you know, uh, is just so like high energy and fun. And, and I think whatever age you are, if you're not going to connect with that sort of raw power that that music and drumming has to offer then then what are you doing so in that sense and you know i still listen to the beatles all the time and there's so many just two bar do that do that do that do that really simple or i guess that that's just like a one bar pattern um you're so um what's it called paperback writer do that do that do get to that you're so romantic and i mean that maybe is right can you take a look and that's like such a simple he just does this little hi-hat thing at the end of it he would always just throw in these little oh here you go here's an extra little spice you know here's an extra little thing that you wouldn't expect and the beatles we've all heard all those if you like music you've probably heard all those songs too many times they had a few good songs, eh? The Beatles. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, they did yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but have you watched the the? Everyone tells me to watch it. It's like okay, six yeah. hours in the studio. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I gotta watch that. What's it called? Uh, I think it's called. Is it called Get Back or is Get it, Back? Yeah, it's called it, yeah. Get Back. Yeah, because I wanted to say, is it called Let It Be? No, it's called Get Back. And the coolest part of that whole thing is just the moments where. They're just getting to the studio, everyone's, and oh my gosh, they're just, they all smoke the whole time. It makes you realize, whoa, in the late sixties, everybody was smoking cigarettes all the time. And quite frankly, like I'm a non-smoker, smoking's bad for you, disclaimer, but quite frankly, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like they look, and, they and look you could cool. smoke anywhere, right? Inside, yeah, in, in a plane, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So everyone's smoking and then they get to the studio. Oh, have a tea, have a coffee, whatever, cigarette. And then a lot of the time, to start their sessions or halfway through their sessions to take a break, they kind of just jam. 
And maybe they'd go into, oh, here's a part from some song from a few years ago. Or there's a scene where Paul McCartney is playing a bunch of stuff on a piano and it ends up being all these songs that are on Ram and on Band on the Run and on a bunch of his solo and Wings stuff, right? But some of the greatest parts of that whole thing, which again, I know, I'm sorry if people are telling you to watch it and it's it's you're hearing that ad nauseum, but in my mind, the best parts are like, oh, they're just the Beatles and they're just jamming, you know? And it's just, oh, now John Lennon's on drums or now Paul McCartney's on drums or now, you know, Paul McCartney, well, it, McCartney, it's like, oh, he's on drums. Now he's on bass. Now he's on piano. Now he's on guitar. Now, like, I, I really, the older I get, the more I realize that Paul is the best Beatle. Hot take. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear that the best part of that is that it shows that they're human. Like it's yeah, not, sure. it's not like you're just seeing the biggest band in the world with, you know, 200,000 people in concert. It's like, these are four humans in a studio trying to make a great album, you know? Yeah. And like somebody's late or somebody completely just messed up that last, what, somebody just made a mistake, even though, for the last two hours they've been playing and it sounds picture perfect. And even some of those scenes you're watching what made it on to let it be the final master. Right. But, oh, okay. You hear each of the four of them make all sorts of errors here and there while they're playing. And even that alone, you know, is wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. These guys were just, just, just human beings. So we're we're gonna dive into the the Colorado stuff, go through yeah, the discography, the career, all that. Um, yeah, one final question, uh, wrapping up the growing up questions. You had mentioned that you know there's these bands with these strong identities. One of them that you mentioned was Rage Against the Machine. Uh, they're playing our hometown of Ottawa uh, at Blues Fest in the next month or two. Uh, I got tickets to the full Blues Fest. So I'm going every day. There's lots of great artists. Are you going to see Rage at all? I mean, this is going to be incredible. I never thought I'd be able to see them once they bro broke up a while ago. Yeah, I should. You know what? I should hop on the Blues Fest website and take a look at some stuff. And we should we should make a plan to go. I I have seen. You know what? I saw my friends in Tokyo Police Club play. I guess it was last year's Blues Fest. It was pretty pared down because of COVID stuff. I mean, it was still a big outdoor show. It was them and. I can't remember who else played, but it was at Le Breton Flats. No, it wasn't at Le Breton Flats. It was at, uh, what do they call it? Lansdowne. And other than that, I haven't really seen a band in two years. Yeah. So I should, I should check out some of that stuff. I've never seen Rage live. And that honestly, it's one of those things that going to see live music has just been so not on my radar because you just kind of get used to not doing it, which also sounds weird. But yeah, I should, I should go to that show. That would be yeah. Good. So, so as a heads up, uh, I, I was for sure going to go to see just rage. And then when I look, looked at ticket prices, just rage against a machine is let's say it's like, it's pretty expensive. It's say it's like $170. Like it's quite a bit. Yeah. And then the full blues fest pass. So to see like 300 bands, including all the headliners, the full early bird pass was like, $220. So it's like, okay, if I just see Rage and I go see one other band, it's more expensive yeah, yeah. than getting the full. So as a heads up, I got the full pass because financially it makes sense. There's some good artists. There's the Tea Party playing and Three Days Grace and um, Alanis and Garbage and Luke Combs. And it's it's a pretty stellar lineup this year. Anyways. Yeah, I should I should get back into that mindset of seeing live music. <laughs> oh, it's all good. So diving yeah. into Colorado, you, you already mentioned how the members met each other. I mean, one of them lived in your home, one of them lived down the street, one of them was like a town over. But yeah. how, how did you guys come together as musicians? How did you decide that starting a band might be something that's cool? And and Colorado, how'd you come up with the name? It has to be a play on Colorado, but you can dive into that. I mean, I think the most concise way to put it is we all were at a stage in our lives where starting a band where all we did was rehearse for eight hours a night was plausible, doable, and really appealing to all of us. So that's kind of how it happened. We all sort of were at these junctures. Menno had been in a ska band that had broken up called The Delegates. 
I was in between high school and university and just starting school and not really liking it. And Nick was two or three years out of a four-year engineering program that he was enjoying and doing well, but starting to get, I think, maybe a little bit burnt out. And Nick, Nick is just like a friggin' workaholic. So he would, he would go to class, write papers, take tests, whatever it is that students do, I couldn't even tell you. Uh, and then at night he would come rehearse with us for four, five, six, seven, eight hours, and then get up and rinse repeat. He's just so he's got boundless energy. So kudos to him for being able to do that. And Dean had graduated high school. He was his idea was to take some time off, and we and you know he hadn't signed up for a post secondary program, and we just all were in a similar yet different sort of headspace and physical space that starting the band just kind of felt natural. And the name, I don't know. I, I think, I think this is really typical. It's al almost to the point of it being a cliche, but I don't think it's a great band name. And I think, I think if you're a guy who's in his mid thirties and you think the band name of a band that you started with some friends when you were 18, you think that's, a really cool band name that you thought was good when you were 18, then there's probably a problem, you know? <laughs> um, it, and anyone, right. You hear, you hear it again. It's a cliche. You hear Dave Grohl saying, Oh, Foo Fighters, the dumbest band name ever, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Green Day. What a dumb band name. You know, everybody thinks their own band name is stupid. And I think that it's, it's something that's just a weird thing. Bands are weird. It's a weird thing. And I don't really remember how the name was thought up but by the third or fourth year of the band we had an inkling that oh this is like not a great band name two things about it though firstly it was cool because even early on you know we're out playing shows we're meeting other bands we're trying to get signed to labels that never ended up signing us we're doing all these things that we think bands are supposed to do and that bands do. And somebody would say, Hey, what's your band called? And it might be the promoter or it might be the band we're opening for or whomever. Right. And we say, Oh, our band is called Colorado. And they would say, Oh, Colorado. And we'd say, no, Colorado. So it kind of, in a weird way, it sort of forced us or allowed us to say, no, it's called this with an H. And I think that was ultimately a good thing because it sort of forced you and it got really, really tiring, but it forced you to say, no, the band is called this. And it's an H, not a C. And maybe that created some memorability. Maybe that aided people's memory in, in remembering what the band is called because they'd heard it twice rather than once, right? I don't know. That, that's something that's, that's come to mind over the years. The second thing was, right off the bat, it just H-O-L-L-E-R-A-D-O -L -L -E just wasn't anything else on Google, right? That At that point on Google, later on, on Facebook, on Instagram, you know, that wasn't anything else on MySpace, right? So when we started in 2007, when that was relevant. So that I think... Yeah, bands always have a fear of, you know, lawsuits that actually, you know, in a small town in the UK, there's already a band called Colorado, right? It's, yeah. it's, so if you can make up a word, um, there's a better chance that, you know, this brand you're building for a decade that it's not going to be taken away from you, you know, if there's a yeah, lawsuit. Yeah, and if it's also, un, you know, it's dissimilar to anything else that already exists enough, then when somebody's googling that just phonetically thinking oh how is that ben spelled their name even if they misspell it they're probably going to find you on the internet i and again these are just things that i think maybe helped but i have no way of verifying that that's completely anecdotal information and i have no clue so i've, I've had yeah. qu quite a few guests that have said that they they don't like their own band name so yeah, and that's the, it the, right? the standstills um the standstills and there's one other band that they were already, what was it? They were already signed and they already had their band name before they even had the rest of the band members. Oh, it was um, Triumph, the band Triumph. Uh, there was a couple members. They weren't even a band yet, but just like two of the members 
had a record deal just because they were so talented. Someone, a label signed them. So they decided to start a new project. So they were called Triumph. They didn't even have a full band yet. And then, you know, you can't change the name after you have success. So it's the same thing with the standstills. They were already signed and they're like, I don't know if our name's any, even though it's a good name. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's almost like every band kind of regrets their band name, but it, it ends up being about the music anyway. So even That's names it. like, yeah. you know, Rainbow Butt Monkeys or um, <laughs> Red Hot Chili Peppers, like all these ridiculous names, it ends up just being something cool. It doesn't really matter what, you know, the band is called. Well, yeah. And I mean, ultimately... It's just, you know, it's the same sort of thing as people, right? Like I, I f- always feel for anyone who's named Karen. Cause it's like, okay, that's been co-opted as this whole thing. But also as soon as you get to know somebody named Karen, if they're a cool person, then you completely forget about that in it, entirely. Right. And it's, it's the same sort of thing. It, it doesn't really matter or a restaurant can have a dumb name and if they make great tacos you're going to go there to eat tacos you know (laughs) like it doesn't doesn't really matter yeah so i I remember back when you guys started so i I believe you guys formed around 2007 um between 2007 2008 you guys released these five demos so it was demo in a bag and i actually physically remember receiving a cd in a clear bag uh right. so i don't know if that was demo in a bag or if later when you did record in a bag if those were actually in a physical bag as well um how did the idea of making you know five demos and and the aesthetic of having them in a bag how did that come about well i think that was all born out of necessity it was probably Menno's idea that really that feels like a Menno idea in a good way and and i mean you know he had so many throughout the entirety of the band he had so and still in his life he had and has so many quirky, weird, creative ideas that you go like, I don't think you can do that. Can you do that? Oh, I guess you can do that. Okay, cool. And that, but that was born out of necessity because we were on the road and we needed to put gas in the tank of the van. And we had the recording of two or three songs. Okay, we can't call this an album. We can't even really call this an EP. This is 15 minutes of music. Not even, it's 12 minutes of music. So what can we call us? Okay, it's a demo. All right, we would buy cd burners from best buy and then we would return them before the 30 day return policy so we'd get our money back right so you could you could get a cd burner for free effectively this is boys and girls this is cheating the system a little bit this is a lesson on cheating the system this is also banned success 101 so i mean at that point in time although now now it's like i don't know if anybody would want to buy a cd at all anyways right I, my laptop that I'm using for this call doesn't even have a CD player in it. My car does, but anyways, so we'd buy these CD burners and we would burn our demos onto a CD. Okay. What do we have lying around? Oh, or what are cheap sandwich bags? Okay. So we've got a demo. It's not an album. It's not an EP. It's a demo. Cause it's just 12 minutes of music. And we got a sandwich bag. We've got a demo in a bag. It's born out of necessity. I think again, I'm pretty sure it was Menno's idea, but It's something that in hindsight, it was like, okay, if we sell enough of these, we can then put gas in the tank of the van and make it to the next town and play another show where we sell more of these to put gas in the tank of the van to make it to the next show, rinse, repeat. And another thing we would do in the early days was we would go to malls in Canada, in America, and we would have a disc man in the COVID era this sounds insane we'd have a disc man and a pair of over-ear headphones with our demo in a bag in the cd player and we would go up to people and we would literally say hey excuse me do you like rock music it might be an old person it might be a young person didn't matter what their gender was we would say that to whomever right and if they would say yeah we would say hey do you want to listen to our band for a second and if they said, yeah, we put the headphones again in the COVID era, this sounds insane. Put the, the headphones that any number of other people have had on their ears, put them on their ears, press play. Maybe you think, okay, I think this person out of the three songs that are on this demo, I think this is uh, the third song type person. Press play. They listen to it for 30 seconds and they go, yeah, you know, that's okay. Or they go like, oh, this sucks ass. I hate it. Whatever, whatever they say. You then say, okay, we're trying to get to city x maybe now we're in 
Burlington, Ontario, and we'd say, hey, we're trying to get to Hamilton. And they'd say, well, that's 15 minutes away, so get out of here. Uh, or whatever, I'm, I'm joking, but we'd say, okay, we're currently in whatever mall we are in and we're trying to get into it. We're trying to get to a town that's 200 kilometers or if we're in the States, we'd say miles away from here. Would you like to help us out? Would you want to buy a copy of this three song demo that you just listened to 30 seconds of one of the songs? We've got them right here. It's in a Ziploc bag. And we're basically asking for whatever, whatever you are willing to give. You know, we'd say, yeah, you know, four or $5, but if you've got one or two, that's fine. And we literally, like we did this, I don't know how many times, maybe it was five times, maybe it was 500 times. I have no idea, but more than a handful of times we do that in a shopping mall. And maybe you end up with a hundred dollars between the four of us walking all around these malls with headphones and, and disc men, CD players. And then it's like, okay, cool. We can all go to the food court and get a burrito or whatever. And then you can put the rest of the money into the gas tank. And then you're back to square one again. It's and, like fancy busking. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, and I mean, that was something that funded at least the first handful of really, really scrappy punk rock DIY tours that we did. And that, that was like, you know, I don't, I mean, in a COVID era, you definitely couldn't do that. Uh, people would be like, get away from me. You know, I'm not putting those headphones on my ears. And, and again, there's so, there's so many reasons that I don't think you could do things that way. You know, like you always hear about, like Dave Grohl is a perfect example. Okay. I love Nirvana. I'm a big enough fan of the first couple of Foo Fighters records. Absolutely tragic that Taylor Hawkins died so young. All those things being said, Dave Grohl will often go on these grandstand sort of speeches. And I don't think he's a bad dude. I just think he's a bit old and rich and out of touch. He will go, he will make these grandstand style speeches about, yeah, you just need to get into a garage with your bass and your drums and your guitar, just like Nirvana did. And you can do that and sound like shit and go on tour. And yeah, yeah, you, you can become the biggest band in the world, sort of, yes, kind of, but also not really. Like the idea that, and I think this is, the, this is just true about life in general, the idea that anyone's going to succeed in the exact same way that you did is probably, probably incorrect. You know, I think the idea of if you really want to do something, do it. Whether it's you want to write a fantasy novel, do it. You want to paint pictures of your friends that you then sell to them, do it. If you want to start a podcast, do it. If you want to make animated short films and put them on YouTube, do it. The idea of if you want to make art, by all means, make art, make content, fill your fucking boots, man. But the idea that like, oh, listen to me, kids, this is what I did. And it worked out pretty darn well because my band Nirvana did really well. And then I started another band like that seems completely insane to me. And I think it's a matter of you know, somebody who's 50 and a millionaire is not in any industry. Somebody who's 50 and a millionaire is not going to succeed in the same way that like, who's a modern success story, maybe Billie Eilish, right? Billie Eilish has not succeeded in the same way that Dave Grohl has succeeded. And that's like, both of their success is completely valid. Both of them have made super cool music. And the idea, I think it's important to kind of recognize that, okay, there is an element of right place, right time, but it, there's also an element of, yeah, we were doing things that worked at the time that may or may not work now. Anyway, so that's my, that's my grandstand speech that maybe is just as out to lunch as, as how I feel every time Dave Grohl is like, yeah, start a band, whatever. And yeah, start a band, by all means, start a band, you know? Yeah, here's, here's advice from someone that was in two of the biggest rock bands of all time who has a net worth of like $250 million. But uh, exactly. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> and like, you know, I mean, well, it's, it's really cool to study people who have succeeded to that degree. It's really, really cool. You were saying earlier, one of the things that I can't remember whether this is when we'd actually started recording or not. One of the things that all sorts of successful, uber rich, uber successful people have in common is they meditate, they're grateful, they take care of the health, of their health. Yeah, that's all awesome. But 
It's also really cool sometimes to study people who are stable and happy and comfortable, and maybe they don't have that absurdly large bank account or live in a mansion. You know, it's also, you don't necessarily have to model your life after the Jeff Bezos's and the Dave Grohl's and the Elon Musk's. Like there's a lot of human beings in this world that have succeeded and achieved their goals to a certain degree. And they're quite frankly, like just fine and happy with that. Yeah. There's different, different measures of wealth. It doesn't have to just be money, right? There's, there's happiness and fulfillment and and love and all those different things. Yeah. Um, When, when we, when our bands were both playing in Ottawa around 2007, 2008, there was a a new radio station called live 88 five and they came in and I believe that one of the reasons that they were approved as a radio station is that they were going to dump a bunch of money back into the local music scene. So they created something called the big money shot, which was yeah. basically the biggest battle of the bands like of all time. You, you, yeah. a band could win like $250,000. We were in it. We, we won like one night. So there's all these different stages of it. Yeah, we yeah. only won our first night and we won like $5,000. Like it was, it was amazing. And you guys went on to win uh one of the big money shots which infuses two hundred and fifty thousand dollars into the band so i'm i'm just like almost no band experiences that how how what are the doors that opened up for you um by by winning the big money shot and and in which ways did that that money help you guys in your development i mean we we wasted so much of that money just having an absolutely fun time. And I think providing a a really insanely fun time for a lot of our friends. And I don't regret that at all because it was the right thing to do by any measure. But one of the things that we did with that money was we bought a van and that was, that was our main van for my gosh. Okay. So that's 2009 at least six or seven years. I'd have to go back and check the tape. So they speak to figure out exactly how long we had that band, but we put hundreds of thousands of kilometers on that thing. And of all of the investments, the investments, uh, you know, that we made, I, I say that because it's like, you know, we were dumb kids who had no business managing any form of finances. One of the smartest things we did was we spent a portion of that money on a van that we just rode till its grave. We, I, I mean, I'm probably getting this wrong, but I think we bought it with about 70,000 kilometers on it. And I think we, I think it was between 350 and 400 when it literally died on the side of the road. One of us driving back to our apartments in Toronto when we were living in Toronto at the time in 2016, maybe. It, it rest, might have been rest in peace, our, our wonderful yeah. Colorado van. Yeah. And we literally, I think, I want to say Dean was driving it. I could be wrong. He just like left it there and called everyone and was like, yeah, the van's dead. It's just completely dead. Um, And in terms of the amount of shows played in that van, yeah, geez, it might be a thousand. It's definitely, it's definitely more than a couple hundred. So that was one of the best things that we did. I mean, I took some drum lessons from a guy in Montreal, a guy named Pat Sayers, who was the best drummer I could find. And I I was, what, in my early 20s and hadn't taken a drum lesson for a number of years since I was, since I had been 18 or something like that. But man, I don't, I, I really think for the most part, we just funneled that money back into the touring machine, you know? We paid ourselves a stipend that was enough for us to, to rent apartments and, and not work other jobs for, for a period of time. And really it was, you know, just, okay, cool. That's great. Let's keep doing exactly what we're doing. I think at that point I got a cell phone. You know what I mean? Like, I think at that point, all or- I, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, at that point I'm in my early twenties and I got a cell phone that I was actually paying the monthly bill and not letting it just lapse. You know, I I think I had had a cell phone before that and I just forgot or chose not, or didn't have the money to pay the bill. 
until all of a sudden you owe Rogers like $300 and you're 19, which, so it's, you know, it feels like a billion dollars and your credit gets fucked up and whatever. Um, yeah, I remember, okay, cool. I've got a cell phone. I, I can text friends when I'm in their city and say, Hey, I'll put you on the guest list, come to the show or whatever. Um, so that was like life-changing in a sense, but really, and I think honestly, man, the, the one of the coolest things about our band was we sort of always said, if some money came in or later on, if we got a, a decent festival offer or winning that contest or anything, it was kind of like, everyone would sort of look at each other and be like, okay, cool. So this means we can keep doing this fun thing, right? You know, people had some more ambition than that to a, to a certain degree, but really the first and foremost thing was how do we keep doing this thing that's so fun? And as long as we could, as long as we could keep traveling and playing and hanging with each other and making music in the studio, then it, it sort of just felt like that was success in and of itself. I have a quote sent in here from someone that was there on the night that you guys won the big money okay. shot. So yeah. this is from Jen Traplin from Live 88.5 oh, yeah. Radio Personality. Here's what she has to say. She says, here's the thing. I have a terrible memory, like the worst. So if I remember something that happened over a decade ago, it's because it's something that really stood out. Oh. And I specifically have a very vivid Jake Boyd memory dating back to 2009. That's when I first met Jake. His band Colorado was competing in and later won the Live 88.5 Big Money Shot. During the competition's finale at what was then the Capitol Music Hall, the crowd was so amped uh, that they started throwing shit on stage. I don't remember what exactly, maybe beach balls. Either way, it was super distracting for the guys on stage who were literally trying to win hundreds of thousands of dollars through, <laughs> through this competition. And I specifically remember Jake addressing the audience at one point saying word for word, let us do our fucking jobs. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's when I knew he was legit. For as much fun as these guys had as a group, he wasn't just some kid messing around in a band. This was his job, and it's a job that he does extremely well. Add to that the fact that he is just about the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Plus, he loves dogs. That's from Jen oh, Traplin, Live 88.5. That's super nice. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I definitely don't remember saying that. And hearing that back now, I sort of feel like, oh, man, I, I, that, I feel like I was taking myself a bit too seriously. Do you but, remember stuff getting thrown on stage? Was that a big thing that was happening? Well, there was a period of time that we, you know what, even those beach balls, they might've been ones that we put into the crowd ourselves. So it's like, there's a degree of hypocrisy there, right? <laughs> That's like, oh, here's some fun beach balls. Hey, don't- How no, dare you throw those beach balls? Yeah, yeah, you know, don't have too much fun now, right? Um, I, no, people were- for the most part, we're always pretty cool. We always wanted and encouraged a lot of participation. And I feel like, you know, in hindsight, probably the other guys were like, oh, Jake, fucking relax, you know, <laughs> like, like, oh, dude, whatever. Like, okay, chill. But maybe yeah, they were physically, maybe the, the, if it was beach balls, they're physically getting in between you and your, your kid. I don't know. There's gotta be. A well, there. there were times that one of those would like hit you in the head and just while you're playing, it would, it would be a bit distracting, right? Um, if you're if you're messing around and somebody throws a beach ball at your head, it's not really going to be too painful, but it is a bit distracting if you're trying to play a drum set. Um, but yeah, you know, we always we always sort of encourage participation. We had confetti guns that people would shoot off, and we'd often bring friends or whomever from the crowd up to shoot off the confetti guns, and we would you know, bring people up on stage to sing or dance or whatever. Like it, it always, I think it was always a vibe that was more like, we're all doing a thing together rather than, oh, we're the band that's up on a pedestal and you are all the lowly audience and we're going to rock you or whatever. It was more like, hey, we're all going to have a sort of community experience. And hopefully we all come away from this feeling a bit better than we felt when it started. R rumor has it that, you know, at one point when you guys were so broke as a band that um, those confetti machines that 
the girlfriends of the band members would actually help to kind of sweep it all up and use the the confetti again for future shows. Is that true or is that erroneous? That might that might be true. I mean, there definitely was reuse and there was a lot of I mean, so many people. I feel like I have a memory maybe of Menno's dad, Hayo, help I'm sure at some point he helped sweep up confetti. You know, and and that was the thing is that so much about our band was so many people involved that helped to make it a thing. You know, even to the extent that I want to, my brain is like, come on, list off some people. But it's like, I almost don't want to out of fear of forgetting someone. And, you know, or again, as Jen Traplin was saying, the idea of misremembering. But really, if anyone ever so much as even thought about coming to a show, we were grateful for them, right? Uh, it, it really always felt like this thing that, and maybe part of it is I was I was the drummer in the band, but it all, it always kind of felt like this thing that it was like, wow, I'm I'm part of a thing that a lot of people are part of, and, and not in a not not in a negative way at all, in a way that's like this is a community of individuals that are all kind of like making a thing happen that I hope on, on good days was making everybody's lives better on good days, (laughs) on good days in in 2009, you guys officially release uh, your, your debut full length. So record in a bag and it started as a, a free digital download and then it got re-released on arts and crafts. So you guys got some support from a label. Uh, what are your, your thoughts, your emotions, your memories? Uh, what comes back when you think to that first debut album that kicked off this amazing journey you've been on? I mean, again, it's, it's so similar to what I was just remembering a few minutes ago in that the whole idea was, okay, cool. That's awesome. An album's out. It's in stores. There's a song or two being played on a couple radio stations in Canada. That means we get to keep doing this fun thing, right? It was always sort of, okay, wicked. We'll see you at the next show. It was never really, it was never really dwelling on what has already happened or whether we had a plan for the future other than, okay, cool. If there's enough money in my bank account to pay next month's rent, then we can keep doing this fun thing. Sweet. Awesome. Super cool. You know, if there's gas in the tank of the van, then, then we can make it to the next town and keep playing. I remember the the first time I heard the album, I was blown away. I think that's like an incredible album all the way through. And I remember being like, you know, one of us have made it, you know, one of us have <laughs> made an incredible album. One of us is, is having a ton of success. So that album had four singles. There was American Arama, if I'm saying that right. There was Juliet, Got to Lose, Fake Drugs. And we have a, a fan question that's sent in here. So okay. uh, this is from Selge Menard, who, who asks, who is Juliet? And then there's a follow-up. Um, what's your favorite venue that you played at? And selfishly, which one's in Ottawa? Oh, okay. All right. So who is Juliet? It's an amalgam of people. I think it was loosely based on, uh, she was loosely based on one of Menno's aunts. But I think like the way he always has written lyrics, it is an amalgam of thoughts, emotions, and experiences. So that, that seems like a bit of a cop-out answer, but it's actually the truth. The next, man, okay, I'm wearing a hoodie of uh, 7th Street Entry in Minneapolis. That's one of my favorite venues. It's connected to a bigger, this is a small room that Colorado would play when we were in Minneapolis that would fit like 100-ish people. It's connected to First Ave, First Ave, I guess it's called. And that venue, I think is where Prince filmed Purple Rain. Oh, wow. And if I'm not mistaken, but also a really cool thing about that venue is that during the period of the pandemic where it was the initial vaccine rollout, they made that venue a vax clinic in Minneapolis. So the the owners and management saying, okay, what the heck are we going to do? We still can't do shows. That venue was a vax clinic. So 
to me, that's really cool. That's one of my favorite venues. I mean, in Ottawa, Capital Music Hall was cool. It closed. I mean, the Bronson Center. Still going strong. I was there yeah. twice in the last month or so. Yeah, it's it was always fun to play. I mean, in Ottawa. I used to love play. Barrymore's, but I hear that that's shut down too now. Yeah. Is Babylon closed now? It is, right? I, I think. Yeah. I had Chelsea Miller on. Uh, yeah. I, sorry. You, you, uh, I think you. You, you sent in a quote for that Chelsea Miller episode, I believe. And, okay. um, and, and, you know, Chelsea, she, yeah. Um, did you send in a quote? I can't remember. Anyways, we, we all know each other. She's awesome. Um, I do. I do yeah, know yeah. she's a fantastic person. Oh, she mentioned you during the episode, which is why I sent that episode to you. Saying oh yeah. That, yeah. Uh, you, you got a powerful shout out from her. Um, yeah. During the episode, she brought me up to speed on all the venues that had closed down. So I had right. Barrymore's yeah. closed down in Babylon and Capitol Music Hall and the live lounge. And anyways, so it's kind of sad, but, but that's, I mean, that's sort of it, right? That's, kind of a theme that I keep coming back to here is it is sad when something like that happens. And when a music venue closes down, it is political. There's a political element. Okay. That has to do with the goings on of a city and the sort of not only the the financial economy, but just sort of like the economy of taste and culture. Right. Okay. So there's that element, but at the same time, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about in terms of if you're starting to get a little bit older, you have a certain way of how things are done. And that might or might not have anything to do with the emotions and thoughts of somebody who's 10, 15, 20 years younger than you. I think it is really sad when venues close, but I am optimistic that they're always this is going to be a place for rock and roll, punk rock, live music to kind of exist. And maybe that's too optimistic. I don't know. But yeah, the, the funny thing about Ottawa is maybe I'm just an old guy, but all my favorite venues are kind of closed. And that's a really dissatisfying answer. And I'm sorry, but it's just the truth, right? I mean, Club Saw still exists, but not in the same way that it was when I was... 15 and going to all ages punk shows there. Uh, Barrymore's is closed. Babylon is closed. Like there was a period in my life when I was a teenager and I would just go anything, you know, remember Punk Ottawa, the website? So this website, Punk Ottawa, would have a list of shows. Sean Scallon, who was running that website, still promotes shows in Ottawa now. He's an awesome guy. And I would just go. If there was something that was all ages at Babylon, I would just go to it. If it was within my price range of like five or 10 or $20, I would just go. I'd buy a ticket at, geez, Record Runner. Is that the name of the record store? Anyways, I would buy a ticket at a record store or I would buy a ticket at the door and I, it would be punk bands from Montreal or from Toronto or from here. And that was an awesome period of my life. But I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think you can sit around longing for the loss of what is ultimately just a box where people are selling beer and merch. You know what I mean? And again, maybe that is too optimistic. Maybe I should be more hyper vigilant about how venues matter because they really do. Um, I mean, just to name some other ones, the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto was instrumental to everything that Colorado did and was one of my favorite places in the entire world for a long time. Um, Paradiso in Amsterdam is maybe the coolest venue in the entire world. It's uh, in an old church and there's a big venue that we never played and a much smaller venue that we played a few times. Um, And yeah, I mean, there's so many cool spaces in the world and things like that, they do ebb and flow, right? And you can have an emotional connection to a space but it's really, you're having an emotional connection to a space and a time, you know, you're having a connection to a period of your life, which maybe you're in right now, or maybe is behind you. And again, maybe this is me being overly optimistic, but I think you kind of just need to go, yeah, that was a really good time. And what, cause ultimately what else can you do? You know, if you want to, especially with the amount of bars, restaurants, and music venues that closed 
during and directly related to COVID-19, what are you supposed to do? You know, like, yeah, you can get in your trucks and go to Parliament Hill and honk your horns and piss everybody off and be a jerk. But what did that achieve? You know, I heard um, I heard some crazy stats during the, the pandemic, something like 90 percent of restaurants and venues that aren't a chain. So not a McDonald's, not a Wendy's, but independent uh, restaurants and venues, 90 percent will not survive the pandemic. And yeah. at one point in Toronto, there was a video that went viral where it was a photographer um, before the pandemic that that drove down and took videos of, of, you know, all the restaurants and bars and stores. And then it showed during the height of the pandemic and it just showed like the for lease for sale for it just showed all the closures. Yeah. And, and it was like every second store and restaurant was closed for good. It was. Yeah. Her, her yeah. Breaking. And that. That's horrible. And it's, it's terrible for everyone involved. It's terrible for the people who used to have a Friday night restaurant where them and their partner or them and their friends would go and hang out. It's terrible for the wait staff. It's terrible for the managers. It's terrible for the owners. It's, there's nobody that that's good for. And that's, you know, again, there's a political element of that. And I have thoughts, but we don't have enough time, you know, unless, <laughs> unless this was a political podcast, I don't really, I don't even think it would be too wise to get into it right it's just it's one of those things where you kind of go well when you do have a good thing going on in your life you got to recognize it because you have no idea the the how fleeting that could be right yeah yeah well well i guess we'll dive back into music so we don't go too <laughs> yeah. deep into politics yeah there you go yeah the uh, the, the first single from record in a bag uh americanorama and while before the re-release you guys independently put out the first music video for it features Dave Foley from uh, kids in the hall. How did that connection get made? And I know that video got a lot of um, a lot of hype and press because of him and because of the, the unique idea and the content. Yeah. We had a friend named John Kastner, who's a really, really nice guy. He was the singer in a band called the Doughboys, a punk kind of pop punk band from the nineties. And he really helped us out early, 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 early on. And I think at one point we were even staying on the floor of his rehearsal space or something in LA. Anyways, this friend who was kind of like mentor is the wrong word because really it was mostly somebody that would party with us and help us do some recordings. Um, and he was good buddies with Dave. They had been roommates in the 90s at like this cool party house that they had, which sounds like an absolutely magical time in both of their lives. That's a whole other story altogether. So our friend John introduced us to Dave at our show in LA and there was 10 people in the crowd, if that. Dean and I were not yet 21. So at that show, we had to wait in the van until it was time to play, go in and play, go back and sit in the van again until it was time to load the Kiro. And our friend John had brought his buddy Dave and after that show, we sort of said, hey, we've got this music video that we're planning to shoot. Would you be in it? If you, if you could be in it, that'd be really cool. And if you don't want to be in it, we get it because we don't really have any money and we can't really pay you anything. And I think, I think we bought him like a plane ticket in a hotel room for a night. It wasn't, I don't think we paid him anything. And if we did, it was an honorarium that was nothing compared to what, you know, he would be expecting if he was booking a, any kind of legitimate gig whatsoever. And he was and is a super nice guy. And that was a bizarre experience for all parties involved. <laughs> what was it like hearing your songs, songs like that on the radio for the first time? It was cool. I mean, it felt like it, that felt like it legitimized what we were doing. And again, to sound like a broken record, every time that happened, my brain would go, cool awesome we can keep doing this fun thing you know uh, it seems to be like the common threads who, through your career is just okay this this buys us a little more time yeah for sure and i don't know what else you would hope to get out of life right oh if you receive a paycheck or any sort of compensation for doing any sort of job if you're thinking anything other than cool, that'll keep the lights on. And I enjoy the lights being on. You know, if you're thinking anything other than that, then 
what the hell, you know? Um, I think the happiest you can be is when you're just doing things that bring you joy and everything you do in your life is, is just to serve that. And I think that that, I mean, I don't know, I can't speak for the psychology of the other three guys in the band, but for me, that was, that was the vibe the whole time. It was like, all right, cool. Sweet. We can keep doing the thing, you know? Yeah. The, uh, the album led to a, a, your first of three Juno nominations. So best new artist, which is a, an awesome one to get nominated for. Um, did that first nomination have a, a special place in your heart? Just to have your country, you know, it's Canada's Grammys, to have your country acknowledge your efforts. Does that mean something or is, is, the, is it always just, hey, that's one thing that buys a little more credibility, buys a little more time? I mean, that was cool because it's sort of that legitimizes what you're doing in other people's minds and eyes. And that was cool because that Juno that we were nominated for, the winner, if you if you were to check on Wikipedia, the winner of that Juno that we did not win went to the band Said the Will, that are a great band, that are still good buddies of mine. And we all partied with them after they won that Juno and we didn't. Uh, during the live broadcast of the Junos, Tokyo Police Club played, I think they played Bambi. They played one of their songs off their fantastic then current album champ which is in my opinion about as good as indie rock gets and you know we ended up becoming really good friends with those guys menos anyway gang band fe features dave monks as one of the four co-lead singers right so it's like obviously it, being legitimate in other people's eyes is great but another cool thing that that did is it just sort of like allowed you a seat at the table with people who ended up some of them end up being really good buddies and some of them all already were you know i personally have always felt really really awkward at any sort of award ceremony or anything like that because it seems counterproductive to a degree but also i was really young and really you know i've i've now i've now since realized that what i was feeling was social anxiety that was undiagnosed right um but there is something it's like a wedding there's something weird you know is there also a little bit of imposter syndrome where it's like we're just some guys from manatech just playing in a band with friends and here we are at canada's grammys like is there any part of you that's like i don't know if i should be here i think yeah i think so but i think there's also for me and maybe this is my, this is something that i need to unpack myself but there's also an element of like what are we all doing here? This isn't the thing, you know, like, okay. Like music's the thing, right? And this well, yeah, is the yeah, promotion yeah. of music. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's something that's, that's my own hang up that has nothing to do with anything. And it's not, you know, it's not an indictment of anyone or anything. Just in the, in the few times that we were in situations like that, you know, it's the same sort of idea as like, two people can have a really elaborate fancy wedding. And that doesn't mean that they have a nice relationship, right? Uh, you can be like, you can win an award and that doesn't actually mean that the thing that you've made is good. It just means that the people, the select group of people, frankly, who made that decision chose that thing. And, you know, like I'll still, whatever, I'll watch the Oscars or the Grammys or the Junos from time to time. And it's, when you look at that sort of stuff as a good bit of fun, then it is a good bit of fun. But it always, to me, just kind of felt like this is the thing that's about the thing. This isn't the thing itself, mm. I guess. Yeah. I, what a lot of people don't know is that the award shows are a creation of the record labels and of the, the film studios. So the, the Grammys and the Junos and the Emmys and the Oscars and the Golden Globes, it's the um, the origin story of these award shows is the record labels or film studios would look at the year and it's like, okay, the Christmas quarter um, is the best selling because everyone's purchasing gifts, a lot of times music and movies for other people. So they looked at the year and they saw that the first quarter of the year has the slowest sales for everything. And they yeah. said, how could we boost this? And they started award shows in the first quarter of every year because any of the nominees and especially the winners 
the the album sales and 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 movie ticket sales would go up you know a thousand percent and and it allowed them to make the full year a steady boost instead of a low quarter so it's actually like a not a nefarious but it's a marketing machine yeah you know and and it, there is credibility and it's great to be recognized, but that's actually how it came to be is it's just another promotion tool. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately, if you want to keep the lights on and keep doing the thing, then you need those, you need those things about the thing to promote the thing. And that's, that's all well and good. But to me, it just, it, for whatever reason, it never really felt natural. And that's largely because it is an unnatural thing. So that being said, you know, all the people, all the crew that throw those events and all the sound technicians and camera operators and the, the people that host all those ceremonies and everyone involved, you know, the stage managers and what have you, they're all, they're all great people who work in the live entertainment industry. It's not, it's not an indictment of anyone. It just was for me, something that I always felt kind of weird about. It's kind of secondary to the music itself. I have For sure, a, yeah. I have a quote sent in here from a fellow drummer. So hmm. this is from John Marco Fiaconi of the Dream Boats and formerly uh, White Cowbell, Oklahoma. So this yeah. is someone. This is someone I went to school with when I first moved to Toronto. He was the first drummer I jammed with, and I remember we were just playing around and practicing for fun. And he, you know, he's such a nice guy. He says to me, all worried, he goes, "I just want to let you know that." you know, I, I got this audition with White Cowbell, Oklahoma, who's like this legendary band that every musician loves and has a rabid fan base. And he's like worried to tell me, you know, I have an audition and if I get it, I don't know if I'm like, go dude, on, go yeah. for it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And he ended awesome. up being their drummer for years. So anyways, John Marco sent in this quote. He says, I always admired Jake's drumming with Colorado. His parts continually complemented the song so well. I used to jam along to record in a bag in my basement on the drums because all the songs were just so much fun to play. I don't say this often uh, about many records, but the drumming on record in a bag is probably one of my favorites in the last 15 years. The tones and the mix came out so well, and the parts are just a blast to play. And he put two of like the rock, whatever the rock <laughs> yeah. emojis. Uh, he says, I used to tell producers, I want my drums to sound like that. So that's oh, GM that's so cool. from the dream boats. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, I know him by the, you know, the initials rather than the full name. So when you first said his full name, I was like, who? no, no, a really nice guy, really, really good drummer. So the sounds on that record, it's all Gus Van Gogh. Okay. Yeah. I, I was the one sitting there playing the drums when he hit record, but, but I would not be the person that I am if it wasn't for Gus, the producer who made just about all of the Colorado music. I think he still did some mixing on the final record that we recorded ourselves. And honestly, he is salt of the earth. It's, it's difficult for me to imagine a human being more intelligent and compassionate than he is. And also in terms of making drums sound real damn good on rock records, I can't think of anyone that I like their drum tones better. Um, Winter Sleep, you know, older records like The Stills and Priestess. But like, you know, America by Winter Sleep. Lowell, Lowell Campbell is a fantastic drummer first, you know, just right out the gate. But in terms of exactly what I would want my drums to sound like, that's really, that's it, right? And I don't know, I'm, I'm at a loss for words talking about Gus because he's such a great guy and... I could tell you a million stories that would be mostly super embarrassing to me where he would kind of take me aside, usually when I was really, really young and say like, dude, okay, like you're 19 or you're 20 or you're 21. And like, you're, you're kind of messing up and here's why, uh, you know, or, or, you know, Jake, you see things this way and that's cool. You have your perspective, but like, Hey, maybe think about this. Uh, and both, both in and out of a musical context and both in and out of, uh, context that has anything to do with drumming yeah the the producer that made those records is one of the best human beings i've ever met and really if i had anything to do with how good that record or any of the Colorado records sound then 
it was because of his influence and not because of my own innate talent or whatever. Um, yeah. So that's, that's really nice, but honestly, I'll, I will defer the compliment to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, I was going to say that, uh, winter sleep is actually my favorite band, my all time oh, favorite amazing. band. Yeah. And, uh, a few months ago I had winter sleep singer and guitarist, uh, Paul Murphy as a guest on the yeah. podcast. So that was like a highlight of my life. And, um, lo- so recently I went to see Billy talent live and oh, I'm Lowell was playing with them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm looking, that. I'm watching Billy talent and I'm like, why does their drummer look like Lowell from winter sleep? And at yeah. one point later on, uh, you know, uh, the singer Ben introduces the band and he goes, and on the drums, our new friend Lowell. And I'm like, Holy <laughs> shit. my, my, my friend in winter sleep is playing for Billy talent and he's still yeah. out on tour. And, um, there's, there's a conflict, um, you know, Bill, Billy talents, drummer, um, had has ms which yeah, makes it Aaron, hard right? for him to perform so then yeah. their friends uh, in alexis on fire i believe it's jordan on drums jordan? comes yeah. in and plays for billy talent but yeah. because of the pandemic it's like no musicians made money for two years so now both yeah. alexis on fire and billy talent are back touring um so uh, there's a conflict and in slips Lowell, uh, from winter sleep to play drums for Billy talent. And what's, what's cool is a few episodes ago, I had, uh, rich Beto, the drummer from finger 11 and St. Asonia, St. Asonia. And he actually talked about winter sleep and Lowell as well saying he loves, you know, him as a drummer and he loves the band and all that. So winter sleep keeps coming up, which makes me happy that, uh, the name keeps coming out here. You know, there was one of my favorite stories or memories, I guess I should say about Lowell is, I think it was Hope Beach Volleyball, but it was one of the, one of the music festivals that takes place in Ottawa at Mooney's Bay. That's what that beach is called, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's Hope. Yeah. yeah. So there was a handful of bands on the lineup and I can't remember everybody, but I know Fast Romantics, Colorado and Winter Sleep were three bands. And I think it was like in, in that order, one after the other, and there's other bands that play that I'm forgetting, uh, whatever. And so Nick McKinley, the drummer in Fast Romantics, and myself had already finished our sets because we had played before Winter Sleep. And I remember going up to Nick and we were kind of congratulating each other. I was sort of saying, yeah, man, I think you had a really good show tonight. I think you're playing sounded fantastic. That the whole band was cooking. You guys sounded great, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, oh, Jake, yeah you guys had a really good show, Jake. I think your drums sound great, blah, blah, blah. So we're sort of like slapping each other on the back, being all congratulatory backstage. And then Winter Sleep starts to play and we kind of like, Nick and I sort of looked at each other and it was almost, we almost just like shared a look. I don't know if he'd corroborate the story, but in my mind, we both immediately were thinking like, no, 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 that's what a real drummer looks like. Yeah, there are levels to this game. Like, yeah. And it's like, okay, cool. We both had a really good game of checkers we both played a really good game of checkers, but like, check it out. It's 3D chess right there. Um, Cause yeah, there's something about, something about the tone that he gets out of the drums and he's playing YC drums, right? Made by uh, Ottawa's own Jordan Gauthier. Just to throw another shout out that any, any drummers watching or listening to this will get and nobody else probably will. Um, but uh, yeah, Lowell, there's just something about not only the drum parts, but also just the feel. And it, it, there's something about his attitude while he's playing drums that you're like, yeah, man, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Their live show, a big part of it is his drumming and there's like extended breaks and, and lots of cool stuff. Uh, so, so 2013, you guys put out your, your sophomore album, um, white paint, uh, three singles, pick me up. So it goes desire 126. I I have a picture I want to share with you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we'll see if this science. So let me know if you can see this. So I am in the music video for Uh desire 126. So you can see here in the crowd, I got a little yellow arrow (laughs) and uh, my, my, my same backwards black hat is on there. And then (laughs) at the bottom, you can see I'm, I'm very dark in the shadows. Uh, but I am, I was at that music, uh, video shoot. It was cool. I think you played a concert and then, um, and then we focus on that one song to, to make the music video. Um, so wh- where did the idea 
for that music video, you know, desire as a, as a drug and getting Dave Foley back, uh, where, where did that all come from? I, I, I thought it was a great video. I'm also heavily biased because I'm in there. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, geez. I mean, it might've been our idea. It might've been the director. That was a period of time. There have been really brief, intense periods of my life where all I was doing was playing, playing drums for a living, you know, quote unquote. And that was a period of, of my life where we played a ton of shows that year. And it's all just kind of like, I'd have to, I'd have to do some research as weird as it sounds about my own life to, to figure out the answer to anything about 2013 and 14. Cause it was just so absurdly busy and all over the place. And it was a kind of thing where it's like, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and go, where am I? Oh yeah. My apartment. Okay. Cause you're not, you're really not sure, um, you know, where, where you even are because you've just been all over the place so much. But I, I think the idea, you know, to have Dave be back involved in what we were doing was always kind of there. And that, that largely was because he's such a good hang. I mean, I can't, I can't picture, you know, the nights out that we'd have, I can't picture nights that I've laughed so much. And it's, it's like, oh, okay, like a lot of people who work in comedy, you clearly just thrive on making people laugh. This isn't just your profession. You also just, like, it fuels you. And, yeah, I think that video came out. And, again, we kind of just said, like, okay, cool, and then just got back to the grind, you know? Yeah, is the song So It Goes the most fun Colorado song to play live with, you know, the drum intro, the blistering tempo, there's some other cool drum work. Do, when you look down at your your set list at a concert and you see that song coming up, does that get you more excited than any of the other songs? That was, it was really fun to play. One of my favorite things about that song is, this is really, you know, what you're not supposed to do showing people how the sausage is made you know oh no don't learn how the, the sausage magician is made. shows its, tri yeah. its tricks yeah so there were songs that i would play to a click live so we're playing to a metronome so the tempo whatever i do even if a fill speeds up or a little bit or one of the guitar parts speeds up or slows down a little bit the overall tempo is going on because in my ear there's something going to click it did 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 so a metronome a click whatever you want to call it that was one song that I would I would play to a metronome for a period of time and then I can't remember what it was maybe it was a sound check maybe it was rehearsal that we didn't use the metronome I didn't have that sort of guide and we all kind of agreed oh that song actually works better there was a handful of the songs that even though the recordings were done to a metronome for the live version of it if it were to speed up and then maybe slow down in the bridge and then speed back up in the next chorus or whatever that actually worked better than it being more or less the same tempo. And so it goes as one. I think, I think my memory is Menno being like, man, that actually feels better when we don't have the metronome involved and me feeling really positive about that because it just felt more like authentically playing music, you know, and okay. For recordings, unless you're going to do everything live off the floor, you probably want to record to a metronome, right? It makes overdubbing way easier. It makes changing things in post a lot easier. It makes fixing things a lot easier, but live music, there's a time and a place for it to be very polished. There's a time and a place for musicians to use backing tracks and have a ton of extra, you know, uh, session musicians playing with them. And there's also a time and a place for just like three or four people playing without the aid of any of that stuff, no metronome, no extras. And so it goes, it was always really fun. Cause it was one of those where it almost just, and also it was, if I'm not mistaken, man, oh man, it's amazing that I can't remember this, but if I'm not mistaken, it was always later in the set. So it always kind of felt like by the time we got to that song, it was like, okay, we're kind of, everyone's sort of loosening up and it just sort of feels like you're able to have fun, you know? So, and I mean, obviously it's about such a serious, it's such a fun sounding, fast sounding thing that is about such a serious topic, right? About 
Menno's grandfather being basically his life being spared in a Nazi death camp by this Nazi officer who was sparing people's lives, even though he wasn't supposed to be doing that in terms of the, what his job dictated. And then Menno's grandfather going back to the Nuremberg trials and saying, this man spared my life. You should spare his. And the Nuremberg jury, is that what the Nuremberg trials had? The Nuremberg jury? I don't know. Uh, them saying, okay, you know, however, it, however it went down, them saying, yeah, his life should be spared. So obviously the fact that it kind of has this serious uh, sort of historical truth and emotional truth to it, it added to, to how fun it was. Right. Yeah. That story was told through the music video. Um, yeah. And it resonated with a lot of people. So I guess for our listeners, if you haven't seen the video, if you haven't heard that story, go check it out. So Colorado, uh, so it goes on YouTube. Um, one thing, so there's a bunch of things that stand out when I think of Colorado. So to me, what stands out is uh, a band that has a lot of fun, a band that, that makes very creative and, and memorable uh, music videos. Um, I think of really catchy one note guitar riffs, uh, some delicious bass lines, some, some really um, funky, catchy drum parts. But one of the main things that stands out is the harmony. So there's a lot of mm. harmonies. There's a lot of hooks with multiple vocalists. How much of an asset to the band was it to have four people that could sing and not just one? I mean, I, it's so funny because I don't think we ever sort of thought that we needed to do that or that it would even make everything better. It just sort of felt like everybody wanted to get in on the fun, you know, it sort of felt, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's really, really hard to remember, but from the get go, I would have a microphone on stage, which some drummers do. Some drummers don't. Hey, who put this microphone here? I guess I'm supposed yeah. to sing into it. Yeah. And I mean, I think a big part of that too, was we all, Menno is in my opinion, a grade, a stage show banterer. And it was one of the funnest things about being in the band is that you never, you never knew where that exactly was going to go, but you have stories you tell and you'd interact with the audience. And also we'd kind of, we'd kind of like rib on each other and we'd sort of sometimes even just like talk about stuff. It was almost like in between songs was sometimes like its own little mini podcast. Um, and I don't know, it, it just sort of, it never felt like, we were trying to exploit the power of harmony. It more just felt like, oh, it's more fun if more people have a microphone. And again, it's, it comes back to that idea of it being this really all in sort of community, right? Where it's a band with a lead singer and a band leader, yet at the same time, it's sort of this group of hooligans that all just sort of do dumb jokes between songs, right? I don't know. It's so many things. Maybe we did. We must have. Had, we must have had conversations about what we were going to do. But it really, in hindsight, it just feels like we just did what made the most sense. I have. Uh, I have some kind words sent in here from another musician. So this is Brendan McMillan from My Darkest Days. So these guys had a gold-selling single, like a huge single in the U.S. Uh, with porn star dancing. It had Chad Kroger <laughs> on it. It had Zach Wild on it. It had Ludacris on it. So these guys were huge. And then the singer from My Darkest Days is, has now been the singer for Three Days Grace for years. So okay, yeah. So so Brendan says Jake is a killer player and an even better guy. It's always a pleasure to play with him. So your band's oh. back when My Darkest Days used to play. Uh, we we play the biggest show we've ever played was at the X in Ottawa, where we yeah. were opening for My Darkest Days. So that's a little bit of history with that band, and I'm sure you guys played with them while they were still active. Definitely, yeah, yeah, back in the day, yeah, back in the day, which was a Wednesday. <laughs> um, so in, in in 2015, you guys release 111 songs. So this is an album, and I guess on the album you put maybe the best or your favorite of those 111 because a, a physical CD can only fit about 80 minutes and 111 songs would be multiple CDs. But can you share, it's a kind of a funny story how this came to be. You, you were actually forced to write over a hundred songs for fans. Can you share why 
Uh, and did you make a grave mistake uh, having that okay. ha- have to happen? All right. Okay. So I'm going to preface all this by I'm looking on, I have like title, like not Spotify, but title, mostly because I'm worried that Jay-Z is going broke. And so I want to make sure. That yeah. His one broke, Billy, right? he might, exactly. uh, he might lose it all in one fell swoop. So I'm opening title because there is an artist now named Ms. Chick, and I'm opening it because I want to make sure I get the spelling completely correct. It is spelled M-I-S-Z-C-Z-Y-K. Now, this artist, Ms. Chick, is actually one of our best friends in the world, Niles Ms. Chick. Niles was the producer that made 111 songs with us. And really, he is a big part of this story. When we put out the album White Paint, we had what was a really primitive version of sort of like a Patreon. And it was only like bundles that were like, Hey, if you pay $20, you get the CD or whatever you get the record. If you pay $30, you get the CD and the record. If you pay t-shirt and concert tickets. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's like a really primitive version of what became that sort of crowdsourcing type stuff. Right. And we had already recorded the album. So we, we got the whole thing asked backwards from, from the jump. And one of the things was the super mega custom bundle or whatever it was called. And you got the CD, the t-shirt, the record, you know, whatever, whatever else. And the, the final ultimate thing was we would record a custom song for you. Now we got started, I guess 111 people bought this super custom mega bundle, whatever it was called. We got started recording these custom songs with them. And we were doing like, put the iPhone in the corner of the room and press record on the voice memo thing and everybody start playing and we'll improvise some lyrics or whatever. And we're going to bang these out in a month, right? Or a week or whatever. We were going to get through them, boom, send off MP3s to 111 people. Bob's your uncle, right? But we got started and we had such a fun time and we roped in, suckered in, who's to say, we paid him, but we roped in our friend Niles Mischick and to, to the extent where he had to quit his job working at an audio, like an audio engineering store, he worked at Moog Audio on Queen Street. He had to quit that because he was like, I'm too busy doing this. So, I mean, I don't know. I can't remember what we paid him, but it was enough for him to like live a subsistence living like the rest of us were. And we basically holed up in a studio for a year and we only left it to play shows, really. Like there were eight hour days, there were six hour days, there were 12 hour days. We would we do that three, four, five days a week. And we'd go out and play two, three, four shows in a week. And at, at some point in that year, we must have gone on tour and had little breaks, but we were in the studio, you know, a hundred uh, plus days that year. We were out on the road a hundred plus days that year. And it completely, we all lost our minds basically. Um, but really, I mean, from that period, I can't remember Oh, I got to plug my computer in. One second, it's going to die. Yeah, no problem. The, uh, this is the the beauty of no no editing. This is real life, you know? Got to charge those electronics. We got to plug them in. At least we have some cool segue music, right? All right, and we're back. Um, yeah, I just had like a little thing. I, it's funny. I brought the charger into this room. This is my little office here. I brought the charger in, brought the laptop in, never connected the charger to the wall, never connected the charger to the computer. So I missed one to two vital steps. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So out of necessity, we had promised these people 111 songs rather than just doing iPhone demos. We hired our friend now's Miss Chick, who is M-I-S-Z-C-Z-Y-K, if I'm getting that right, on Tidal, Spotify, all streaming sources. And we spent a year making these 111 songs and went completely completely crazy in the process that's insane uh the 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 follow-up 2017 you put out born yesterday three singles born yesterday i got you eloise around that time you ended up touring in the uk a bit with some 41 uh what was that experience like and were you a fan of the band before that i remember when some 41 first came out and you know in too deep and and all those songs fat lip uh, I was a huge fan as a teenager. What was that like? Those guys are still playing and still going strong. They're on tour yeah. with Simple Plan right now, playing yeah. huge arenas. So that was some of the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. And it was 
just a whirlwind. The cool thing about Europe is that you can go from city to city really quickly. And that's cool until you realize, oh, hold on, we're in a van and we're chasing a tour that is in tour buses. Tour buses, generally speaking, have a driver that that's their only job. The driver usually does the drives overnight. So the driver sleeps during the day and into the evening. When the show is finished, the band and crew get on the bus. The driver then drives through the night to the next city. That's the way tour bus tours work. So if you're a member of the band or the crew, you never have to even really deal with the drive other than when the bus leaves that night, you've got to be on the bus. We were in a sprinter van, still completely luxury, uh, luxurious by our standards, a nice sprinter van we were renting with all this rental gear, no complaints whatsoever. However, for them, they said, okay, the drives in Europe are short. They're two or three hours from one show to the next rather than these mega long North American drives. So they were playing six, sometimes seven nights a week. So we're chasing that in a van. We're used to longer drives. And basically it was grueling. It was fun. And it was the kind of thing that you'd wake up and go, oh, now we're in this part of the UK. Now we're in France. Now we're in this part of Germany. And even though that tour, if I'm not mistaken, was over a month long, it felt like it went by like that because most weeks we were playing six, seven nights. And it was a hell of a lot of fun. I mean... There were a few nights where their sort of pop punk audiences didn't care for uh, an indie rock band from Canada. And there were other nights where we came across, I think, pretty well. Uh, that's the funny, th the, the funny thing about opening, which we did so much of, right? We did a ton of touring and I don't know what percentage, but a, a not insignificant portion of our touring was opening for other bands. And so you're basically, you're trying to impress another band's crowd, right? You're trying to impress a crowd that may completely dig what you're throwing down, or they might think that you completely suck. And it that wasn't always directly re related to how good of a show you were having as a band. You know, there were nights on opening tours, including that one where, oh man, you're cooking and the band sounded great and we're gelling and everything feels really good on stage. And halfway through the show, you just realize, oh, this audience does not care for us. And vice versa, right? There are nights where you're like, oh man, we're kind of, we're kind of rusty or sloppy or tired tonight or whatever. And the audience is, is loving it. It, it was, it was a weird, a weird thing to, to deal with, but that tour was an absolute whirlwind and a real lot of fun. And yes, I am a huge fan of some 41. I mean, like in terms of pop punk hooks and in terms of what, like you were saying, what age I was when those records came out, it's per I'm the perfect target demo for pop punk, uh, pop punk bands from the late nineties, early two thousands. You know, I'm the target demographic, 100%. <laughs> you, are, you are the chosen one. In uh, in 2019, you guys put out your final album, Retaliation Vacation. Um, I listened to the your entire discography many times uh, in preparation. And uh, my favorite songs on that album are Straight to Hell, Speechless, and King Kong. Um, you guys actually knew before recording that album, or at least before releasing that album that that would be your last. So was it a long time coming where, where you guys decided that you were going to part ways as a band? Well, it was in the sense of we had all been, you know, we've all had other creative endeavors and other jobs here and there, but this had been our, all of our main focus since we were all really darn young. So in that sense, it was a long time coming, but also I think a big part of it was just kind of getting out of the way. Not that we were taking up that much space necessarily, but just getting out of the way for that next generation of, of things. Right. And I mean, I feel like by my expectations, when I was 18 and we started the band at that point in time, it was like, Hey, if I could ever have a month where I don't need to work another job and I can pay rent and eat food and play music, then that is success. And we, we did that, you know, we did that at times. And I, I would think, Oh, if I could go to some places that I've never been to, then that would be great. And we did that. And that felt like success. And If, you know, if I could make a, a, a record or two where I really, really like the drum sound on it, or I really, really like just the songs, then 
that would be great. And we did that and that felt like a success. So it's almost just like feeling so lucky and grateful with how things have gone that not that you, it's not a matter of not wanting to tempt fate, but it's sort of just like, okay, this thing has gone really well. We're all good friends. And if we go out on our own terms, we can probably have this one sort of final super duper fun tour that if anything, the attention will be maybe amplified a little bit if you say, hey, everybody, it's our final tour, right? In hindsight, COVID happened basically while we were playing our final shows, COVID-19 existed in the world and was starting to spread, right, as, as a virus. So in hindsight- You picked a good in, time to retire. Well, in a, in a sense, right? I mean, if we, had, if we had booked that final tour for March, 2020, rather than, you know, September to December, 2019, it would have just been a huge bummer to, th- I mean, I don't even, I don't even know what that would have looked like, but the reality was in many ways, it felt like the right time. And I only have super duper fond memories of that entire 12, 13 year period. And I really only have super duper fond memories of that final 2019 tour. But it was, it was something that we, we consciously talked about. And, and there was, Joel, there was a vibe within the band that as soon as we had come to this agreement that, okay, we're gonna make this record, we're gonna go on this tour, it was brilliant because everybody was just like the pressure's off, you know, the pressure's still on to play good shows and the pressure's still on to have a nice time and make sure that, you know, it all makes sense running a business, which, you know, I want to roll my eyes at myself. You can saying that, but it, it is what you're doing when you have a band, right? If you're going on tour, you're running a business, whether you want to be or not. Money exists, whether it should or shouldn't, it does. You know, again, that's another conversation for a more political podcast, perhaps. But the idea of, I guess, ultimately the idea of like, okay, we need to do whatever it takes to keep being able to do this thing. That thing that I keep coming back to, that was almost like the spell was broken. And it's like, oh, okay, no, we can do this tour and really just live in the moment. And every night, I remember thinking like, oh, cool, this is like, it's sad that maybe this is the last time that I'm sitting behind a drum kit playing in Hamilton, in New York City, in Ottawa, in Montreal, in Halifax, whatever. But also like I am here right now and this is a really nice time. And I think, you know, I think this song at least sounds all right. You know, it's like, it, it really allowed you to live in the moment. And I think that that's something that really would have been lost if we had not, I, I, it's not that, it's not that ending the band was the right choice. It's that continuing on with no vision for the future would have been the wrong one. And yeah, that's, that, that's basically it. That's, that's really it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you speaking about that, it, it reminds me of, of when I hear that, you know, death allows you to appreciate life. Like if, if you lived an infinite amount of years, life wouldn't be precious because why would you do anything today when you know you have infinity to do it, you know? So that, that, that time limit actually puts, you know, grounds you in the present. And it sounds like that's kind of, you know, the, the death of the band or the ending of that band or that relationship made you enjoy the present knowing this isn't going to be forever. Yeah. And that's a life lesson that, I mean, that's huge, right? Do you, are you into stoicism at all? I'd imagine you probably are. I actually just finished a couple books about it. Yeah. Ryan, right, yeah. Ryan holiday is like, yeah, yeah, is yeah. like the main guy. So I finished one of his books and there's a uh, letters from Seneca, I guess is like one of the main. So I just finished reading that too. Yeah. I, I keep, I could find it. I keep a copy of letters from a stoic, the Seneca, whatever it's called. I keep a copy, a hardback copy of that just like somewhere. And every now and then I'll pick it up and read from it. I've, I've brought that book on tour and just you're, when you're having a hard time, feeling anxious, whatever, just like pick up a passage, even at random and just read it and be like, okay, yeah. But yeah, a big, a big stoic philosophy thing is memento mori, right? Remember that you're going to die. And if you do that every day, even though there's a morbid, sad element to that, It reminds you, first of all, any hardships that you're facing, any difficulties 
any difficulties that you're facing are really just minor by comparison. And secondly, you just, and more importantly, you realize, okay, you have a finite amount of time. So you really should be doing the things that you want to be doing with the people that you want to be spending time with. And obviously you need to do things you don't want to do. That's life. But really your aim should be towards doing the things you want to do with the people that you want to spend time with. And, and really, yeah, in a weird way, I think it would have helped me if I was 18 or 19 or 20 or 25 to say, Hey, this band will end at some point. Just relax, you know, just relax a little bit. Um, hey, take it have, easy. Hey, take it easy. You know, like just have a fun time, have a nice time because it sometimes, whatever you're doing, it can feel like you're not doing enough or you're not working hard enough or you're working too hard. We, we overthink things like crazy. And, and just sort of keeping in mind the finite nature of our experience as human beings is super important to just kind of just relax a little, right? doesn't matter I, ultimately. I, uh, I, I have some, some kind words sent in from Chelsea Miller from Live 88.5 radio, radio host, radio DJ. She says, I met Jake when he was sitting behind the kit for Colorado. He's an amazing musician, funny, humble, and just all around nice guy. He's also a dog lover, lover of running. And every time I see him, he's always so welcoming. Please say hi to him for me. That's Chelsea. Uh -huh. Yeah, she's such a sweetheart. That's amazing. That's, I mean, honestly, listening to her on the radio is one of the greatest joys of living in the city again. And I mean, obviously, you know, I've got, I've got a deep connection with that station because they, they helped us out and we were in their contest and we played a ton of their events and whatever, but even just, even just hearing a familiar face, hearing a familiar face, hearing a familiar voice, but that, that she is somebody that as soon as you hear her voice, it's like, you can picture her speaking, you know, there's such personality in what she does. Jen as well. I mean, these guys are fantastic. Uh, a few, a few months ago. Uh, so at the start of this, I mentioned a few months ago, you were the special guest performer at an open mic. I have a question sent in from that host. So this is from yeah. Mike, Mike Lamond. Uh, he, he wants to know, do you prefer the more, you know, settled down nine to five life you have now versus the crazy touring days? Uh, I mean, I, it's so apples and oranges. I feel really happy these days there were periods of time touring and living a more chaotic lifestyle that i felt really happy as well i think i'm only realizing now how difficult for me it actually wow. was to maintain a heavy touring traveling lifestyle and any modicum of of positive mental health whatsoever so it, but it's such, it's such apples and oranges. And also, I don't think if I had just sort of settled into a calm life at 20, I wouldn't have appreciated. I think, I think I appreciate what I'm doing now because of those years. And I think maybe to a certain extent, something that kept me going those years was sort of the idea of like, okay, this is when I, when I would remember this, okay, this is temporary. You know, this isn't just a given that you're just going to be traveling 200 days a year. This is atypical for anyone, right? There's there's a, a pretty small amount of people, especially nowadays in this economy, that uh, travel that much for work, right? So, yeah, to answer your question, I don't know. <laughs> that's a good that's a good answer. I'm going to share my <laughs> screen one last time for a picture. Yeah. So. This is you guys playing at the Air Canada Centre in Toronto. Um, my question is, what is the biggest show you've ever played? And what was it like to play to a crowd of that size? So this, hey, this picture... Wait a second, wait a second. I'm not in this photo. No, I know, but you're in there. That's the, that's, <laughs> I, know, I'm just, I'm I recognize kidding. the three band members. But uh, <laughs> there were pictures of you, but you couldn't see how big the crowd was. So yeah, I chose yeah, this yeah. one. Um, this is so the, this is the Air Canada Centre. Air Canada Centre in Toronto. Yeah. This is a reference for our, our viewers to see how big some of the shows are. Uh, so what was the biggest show and what is it like playing to a crowd like that? Okay, well... We once did a festival in, I can't even remember 
what city in China. And that was a crowd that was smaller than this crowd is in that picture. But that crowd felt to me and still in my memory when I think, what's the biggest show that we ever played? I think of that festival in China in 2009, because at that point, the biggest crowd we'd ever played in front of was whatever, five or 600 or a thousand people or something. And this was like four or 5,000 people. So that immediately comes to mind. And Kevin Lamb was a photographer, really, really good guy. Um, just a little shout out to him. Uh, he took that photo of the Air Canada Center. But big shows, especially on the drums, there's no room for subtlety. You know, that idea you were talking about, Glenn from Blue Rodeo, realizing when he first joined the band, he was just playing like everything really big. When you're playing drums, if you're playing to big audiences like that, there's no room for little subtle fills or little little dynamic things or little ba -ba -da -ba. like you got it's got to be like big. And I think anytime we were playing in front of big audiences, which in my mind is anything more than, you know, a thousand. If, if you're somebody that really played in a big act, maybe you think a big crowd is more than 10,000, but I would always think, okay, make sure I'm just really consistent and really playing good and hard, really, really playing loud. I want everyone to be able to hear that backbeat of the snare drum, because really the idea is I want everyone to be able to follow that. Yeah, dim, dim, dim. yeah, and I, I, I would really focus on just heavy, loud consistency. And really, there was a, we, did, we didn't do it that often, but when we were usually opening and playing in front of big audiences, I would almost always just kind of go like, wow, holy shit, you know, <laughs> like, um, wow, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. That being said, there are some amazing musical moments that you could have in front of 20, 30, 50 people as well, right? Um, but yeah, I think it was always like, okay, focus on consistency and even tempo and playing really damn loud. And which is weird because the drums are being mic'd and they're coming through these massive PA speakers, but it's almost like, okay, I want to make sure everyone hears this in the back, you know, even like yeah. this song is for the people in the back, you know, like I don't, it's sort of silly. And there's so many, there's so many things that you realize in hindsight, like, Oh, my thinking, my thinking there didn't really make sense. And a lot of that is because I was, you know, 24, 25, 26 at the time. It doesn't take much growing older to realize how silly you kind of were four, five, six, ten 10 years ago, you know? Yeah. Someone, uh, someone that knows a thing about live events is concert promoter, Craig Lasky from collective yeah. concerts. So he, yeah. he sent in the following words. He says, I have always loved working with Jake over the years with Colorado. He is oh. a fantastic drummer and more importantly, a great person. I miss seeing him play in Colorado or out at shows since moving back to Ottawa. That's from Craig. Yeah. That's, I mean, I would have a really hard time calculating and I mean, calculating, not just counting. It's like, I would need to, I would need to get a, an abacus out if I wanted to, to count up the amount of shows that I've either been at or played that Craig Lasky was the promoter. And I mean, so many like, geez, I want to say Colorado's 13th or 14th show, something like that. He, he was a promoter. It was, it was really, really early on that he was involved in terms of promoting what we did in, in Toronto. And yeah, really nice guy also. I have, I have, so we're, we're getting near the end of the episode here. So I have yeah. a few, few fan questions, a few comments I got to get through or else yeah, I'll break, yeah. break those people's hearts. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this is from the bass player for the band, the reason who are awesome. So this is Ronson from yeah. the reason he says, Jake's a great dude and a great drummer. I love his flipped Tom and was inspired by his path to sobriety some years back. Hope he's doing well. Um, oh. So during, during the, the pandemic, you know, uh, people that are isolated, it hasn't been good for mental health. Yeah. Unfortunately, people are um, resorting to, to drugs, to alcohol, uh, some 
you know, suicide even. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important that it gets talked about. We did a, we, we spent 45 minutes with um, Rich Beto of, of Finger 11. Um, he was talking about his addiction and recovery and it was very important. Um, are, are you open to talking just a little bit about your journey of yeah. how, how it came to be that alcohol was so prominent and then yeah. how you're able to, you know, uh, how you're able to, to, have your recovery and what life looks like now uh, and, and kind of the difference between the two, maybe. Absolutely. Okay. Let me preface this by saying if anyone is using any substance legal or illegal, and if you're doing so in a way that is safe, I'm all for it. I would be the last person in the world to say like, don't drink, don't do drugs, don't smoke cigarettes, especially if you're the Beatles, they look really cool while they're smoking cigarettes that we talked about earlier. But, but you know, it, jokes aside, again, into the realm of slightly political, in my opinion, all drugs should be legalized and controlled. We should look at addiction as a health issue, not a legal issue. That's the, that's the preface. I have a lot of friends that are what you would consider heavy drinkers. I have friends who are drug users. I have zero modicum of of my heart or soul or mind that judges anyone for what they cho choose to do with their own body whether it has to do with drug use or not okay that is a preface um how alcohol became so prevalent you're 18 you start playing in a band and initially it's sort of a vibe of like okay money wise we're getting paid enough money to put gas in the tank and that's it. But there's also a whole case of beer backstage. You literally do not have money at points in time on the road to eat a proper meal. So I would eat like bags of salted peanuts and have four beers, you know, and like, okay, you feel full. Also, years later, and I'll get to this as well, I kind of realized that a lot of what I was feeling, a lot of the negative feelings I, I was feeling in my life stemmed from really intense social anxiety and other forms of anxiety disorder as well. So putting that aside for a second, you put all this together in a pressure cooker and rinse and repeat for two, three, four, five, ten 10 years. And all of a sudden it can really easily get to a point where you've got something that you think you have a handle on and you don't actually have a handle on it. And uh, I really have to credit Menno and I really have to credit Royal Mountain Records, the label that he started that Colorado was on. It still is like, you know, our, our back catalog is, is on. We're still you know, like a part of that, that sort of quote unquote family. He started something that was like, he called it a mental health fund or something like that. And it allowed musicians in any of the bands on the label to access a little bit of money to go to therapy. And I literally used that money to talk with a therapist who his kind of specialty was addictions. And really that was what got me to a point of like health and sobriety and and again, realizing, getting to the root cause of, of why you're doing things that even at the time you go like, I don't want to be doing this. Like what the hell am I doing? I don't even want to be doing this anymore. This, this like sitting in front of a TV, watching the same Simpsons episode that's on reruns in whatever hotel room, drinking like two bottles of wine just because it's like habitual or like at home, not on tour at home. And you're just like, I'm just going to drink like three or four beers every night, just because it's something that you do. Uh, you sort of think of it as a habit, but there's underlying causes to that habit. And the other thing that I would say is if anyone has elements of their life that they want to drastically change, If you're anything like me, you'll realize really quickly that that is in and of itself a job that you have to kind of look at as a job. So if you don't exercise at all and you want to start exercising, it's like, okay, you've just added a, a job. And maybe this is the way I process things. Maybe this is just the way I think of things. Or if you, you know, eat in a certain way and you want to drastically change your diet, then you've got yourself a job, you know? If you want to take care of your mental health, if you've never done that, then you should look at that as a task to be completed, just like you'd look at brushing your teeth, just as you look at bathing or showering, you know, just as you look at like doing laundry, paying your rent, all these things that are necessary for life. 
if you want to make a lifestyle change, then you need to realize that it takes work to do that. It's not just gonna, it's not purely gonna happen because you make a good healthy decision. And it's sort of, I don't know whether this is before we were recording or after, but at some point you mentioned the notion of sacrificing something for something else. And, you know, when you're a kid, you kind of realize, oh, if I stay up too late watching TV or, you know, I was a nerdy kid. So if I stay up too late reading like the second Lord of the Rings book, uh, then I'm going to be tired the next day for school. Like you realize, you know, you sacrifice one thing for, for another. And sometimes that sacrifice is worth it. And sometimes it's not. And when, when you have something in your life, when it's becoming not worth it anymore, then you got to make a change. Right. So I don't know that that's about as rambly as I can get. When, when you think back to the person you were at the peak of, of drinking and who you are today, can you see a huge difference? Yeah, because now, yes, but the initial reaction to things is still there. The initial reaction to things that makes you sad or pissed off or anxious or whatever is still there. So fundamentally, that that spark that would be like, oh man, forget this, go 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 go, go. right? It, all the same things still annoy me, but you learn how to go, okay, why exactly is that? What, it, you know, and like ultimately, okay, I, whatever your flavor of spirituality is, that's cool. I'm not a religious person at all, but a lot of the AA type exercises are super valid and helpful and really like, okay, the one that's just basically, I'm feeling resentment. What am I feeling resentment towards? I'm feeling resentment towards this person or this thing. And a lot of it's about yourself. Ultimately, I feel resentment of myself. Okay, that's that's the thing that I'm feeling resentment towards. What does that affect? What categories of my life does that affect? Does that affect my personal relationships, my sexual relationships, my finances, my um, ability to do my job, whatever? Like, you kind of go through these categories. Okay, that affects, you know, my romantic relationship or my relationship to my own spirituality or whatever you, you figure out what's the thing how's it affecting me and then the third column is really interesting it's like okay how am i involved in the cause of this how am i actually kind of at fault in terms of the root cause of this thing that's pissing me off oh when you start digging into that you realize like especially if you are like i am a privileged white male cisgender heterosexual person you realize really quickly if you go through these kind of categories you get to that one you realize oh a lot of my problems at least to some degree are self-inflicted okay well that's interesting and you kind of just like ruminate on that and then you sort of finish with okay well where do i where do i kind of go from here and if you actually tackle your problems that way rather than being like wow oh, this thing's pissing me off i want to i want to stew and how pissed off I am. And I want to just like feel that for hours and hours and hours. And I want to let it ruin my whole entire day. Then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you are a user of illicit drugs or someone who drinks or somebody who like every single day you binge eat junk food, which like also I love eat, binge eating junk food from time to time. Um, or whether you're somebody that has an addiction to online shopping or whether you're a workaholic, like whatever your flavor of addiction is, if you don't get to a point of just learning how to like basically a more complex version of sitting down and counting to 10, if you don't figure that out, then you're going to suffer. Mm. Or at least that's the truth for me. I mean, maybe, I don't know, like maybe there are people who are less, less emotionally driven than I have a tendency to be. And that must be nice. <laughs> you know, I, think, like, I think that's, that's, uh, that's all great advice. I think that's probably going to be helpful to a lot of our listeners. Uh, we're, we're down to the final two questions. These are some, some deep questions. Are you ready for the final two? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the first one is uh, when you look back on your life and career, what are you most proud of and most grateful for? relationships, people that I'm still friends with that I've been friends with for a long time. I mean, 
there have been a lot of really fun experiences, but I think ultimately, you know, this might sound weird, but having a really good relationship with my parents and that's, that's not like it's a huge achievement. Tons of people have great relationships with their families, but just having a, a good, like healthy relationship with my mom and dad, I think is, it's really awesome. I, I think I've had that or some version of that for a long time, you know, they're they're great people and and i love spending time with them but i think for me it's it's so much more relationship based than than any sort of like achievement and i think i think i don't know about successful people but i think if you talk to happy people people who come across as legitimately happy i think that's probably some version of that is what they would tell you yeah there's a there's a a study it's the longest study ever of of humans. Like they started studying people when they were kids all the way through to, you know, some of them are a hundred years old. Like it's, it's several generations of people running the study. It has to, it's gone so long that it has to keep getting passed down to new people doing the study. And it shows that um, the number one predictor of longevity in life comes down to relationships. So all the people that are 90, 100, um, they all have amazing relationships that make life worth living. So it's like yeah. the will to live is there because of the relationships. Whereas those that don't have great relationships, there's less reason to live, but it's also there's less help if it's needed. Um, if someone is suffering, they're suffering in silence, which leads maybe to more drugs or suicide. So it shows that kind of the, the secret sauce to living a good life and living a long life does come down to relationships. So there's a lot of truth in what you're saying about your parents. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that that's huge. Yeah. Final question with the final, final question. question. Are you ready for this? So oh, if, if we're going to go, we're going to go science fiction for a second here. If there was a time machine, and you could go back in time and you could sit down next to your 10 year old self. So there's, there's cute, uh, cute little Jake sitting there. If you could whisper some words of advice, you've had a lifetime of experience of highs and lows of, of triumphs and failures of, of addiction and recovery of personal growth, mentorship lessons. What, what simple advice can you pass on uh, to little Jake to help him through? I mean, I think my first inclination is to say something along the lines of like, dude, just try and relax, but I wouldn't listen, you know? Hey, hey buddy, just take yeah, it just easy. Chill. Yeah. Jesus. Can you stop talking and just get a full night's sleep? Um, which is what my parents were saying to me every single day at that point in my life. Uh, man, I don't know. I mean, like other than the obvious jokes of like, Hey, borrowed a hundred dollars from someone and put it into Apple stock. <laughs> yeah. Know? Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, geez. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how things have turned out and how they're continuing to go. I, I think I would be too worried to mess anything up, you know? Yeah. You've also, you know, we've gone about two hours and 40 minutes cause there's, there was lots to unpack here. Yeah, you've yeah. also given a ton of great advice over the course of this interview. So, I mean, our listeners already got all that great advice that you might, <laughs> you might have given to your 10 year old self. It's like, you've already shared that. So maybe, maybe you just don't want to repeat a lot of the great lessons you've already shared. You know, I think I would just want to give them like a high five, you know, <laughs> you Depending, rock. Yeah. Just, well, no, you know, just like, just like a, or a proverbial high five, you know, depending on right. I guess there wasn't COVID at that point in time it's so it's such a confusing yeah but maybe you can together. bring covid back in time if you have that's it now it, yeah. who knows you yeah. got to be careful oh with gosh. the whole time space continuum but that's uh, it yeah that's it right the butterfly effect <laughs> yeah so so man we've covered so much is there anything we missed that just has to be shared before we wrap up anything that's still on your mind or just giving you a moment in case there's something no i mean just just i think just try and relax man you know <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah where where can our listeners find you online if they want to reach out and say hey you know i love the interview or i love the music or i want drum lessons or you know do you have any advice for me as i work towards my sobriety where can people find you online is there their oh, facebook man. or is there instagram or it's funny because i'm sort of like 
I deleted Twitter, so that's out of the picture. I tried to spend as much time not on the internet as possible, but yeah, either I, I do have a sort of Facebook account and I do have an Instagram. My Instagram is at Jakery B. I don't really like, usually what I've been doing lately is every now and then I'll go on it and post a photo or something and then delete the app off my phone again. And I've been, I've been doing more extended periods of time lately where I'm, my phone's off or I'm just not looking at it or stuff like, like right now where it's on airplane mode for multiple hours at a time. If anyone wants to learn how to play some drums, this is where I teach from. Um, a lot of, I feel like a lot of the time I end up working with teenagers who want to learn like Radiohead songs or um, K-pop songs or whatever. And that's super fun. I've taught adults as well. Yeah, hit me up on any of those pr platforms if you want to take even one single drum lesson over Skype or, or in person if the fates allow, the, the virus gods. And other than that, I don't know, like I'm not, one of the greatest joys in my life these days is I'm not really actively heavily promoting anything. And that allows me to really not be super duper online. And for me, I find not being super duper online is really good for my mental health. Another and, lesson that we can learn here. So, I mean, but also if you, if you love the internet and you want to use your phone 12 hours a day, I feel the same way about that as I feel about any other drug. Like I'm not gonna, I don't want to yuck anyone's yum, you know, Joel. I hear you. I hear you. So yeah. as we wrap up, I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you, um, you know, your, your lifelong pursuit of mastery as a drummer. I want to take a moment to acknowledge you for, um, you know, pouring your heart and soul into the band Colorado for, you know, over a decade, providing the world with some amazing music that I listen to all the time. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge you for getting sober and then having the courage to talk about it, which can, you know, paying it forward, you're helping out a lot of people that probably need to hear that now. Um, as an owner of a rescue rabbit, I want to say thank you for being a great owner of two dogs, you know, two of our comments, or more talked about you loving dogs and being a great owner. So, uh, you know, thank you for providing animals with a great life. And uh, the last thing is I want to acknowledge you as a fan of Colorado as a fan of the band and the music. It's amazing for me to sit down and talk to you for, you know, going on three hours, so I can ask the questions that I've always wanted to know the answers do so i uh, just wanted to acknowledge you for all those things and say thank you for uh for sitting down with me jake thanks for having me i i don't know if i'm a master of anything but it's definitely if if there's one thing that i'm a master of it's it's rambling for three hours straight so we so all I achieve mastery in some different form so. <laughs> yeah Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jake, uh, to, to uh, the Colorado fans, to Jake fans, to our listeners. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J O E L, and on Twitter at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message, and I'll see you on the next episode.